when it is your turn to speak, a panelist will provide speaking access. You will receive a notification to unmute yourself at that point. Please unmute your microphone and proceed with your comment. After you have provided your comment, your speaking capabilities will be disabled. All right, go ahead, Ed. Great, all right. Today is Monday, September 13th. I'm officially calling this meeting of the Sonoma County Advisory Redistricting Commission to order. Welcome everyone, welcome guests, welcome staff and commissioners. And as always, thank you all for your commitment to this very important process. Um, as I've done at all of our meetings, I'll start today's meeting by reminding the community that this is the first time Sonoma County has assembled a commission to oversee the redistricting process. We are the first. Commissioners and staff are new to this process and we are very actively doing our best to move forward with integrity and commitment. And in the short time that's been given to us to spearhead a public process that is as inclusive and as welcoming as we can make it. Our role is to oversee a process that will actively engage participants in one of the most important once in a decade fundamentals of democracy. That's giving people a voice. And in doing so, this commission is moving forward with the intention to empower voices in our community that we know have been marginalized. The Board of Supervisors established this commission to advise and assist them with the redrawing of our district boundaries. Commissioners were not only selected, but we were identified by the supervisors because of our connectedness within the community. That being said, today's meeting is perhaps the most important one to date. As I tee us off for the next agenda item, I want to thank the Equity Ad Hoc Committee for their work on forming the key elements of today's discussion. Our thanks also to county staff who have supported the ad hoc over the past few weeks. Um, this ad hoc group has done a lot. They've drafted a set of equity principles um, that will be discussed later in the meeting and have also assembled the panel that we'll hear from soon. They've also instructed DNC to make available for our review maps that show key demographic distributions in Sonoma County. Um, at this time, let's, let's identify the ad hoc, have them identify themselves so we can all thank them for the hard work that they've done um, in today's agenda. So if you want to just sound off ad hoc members. Mike Martini. Cynthia Murray. Ana Lugo, and I'll pass it off to Ana Horta since this is taking forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Socorro Shields. All right, and Ana Horta, I think we have all of you. All right, well, thank you again so much for the work you put in behind this. Uh, today's agenda has three key items. First, we'll hear from a panel of locals who represent diverse communities within the county. Uh, following the panel presentation, we'll have a discussion and make a recommendation on equity principles to help guide the map making process. And third, we'll have a review of some maps that show distribution of population by communities of color. So at this time, unless there are any Pressing issues or matters of clarification from the commissioners, I'd like to launch into the panel presentation oh, of the agenda. Uh, so commissioners, any clarifying questions about the agenda? Just raise your hand, wave, speak out. It's Zoom, I don't know. <laughs> I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so before we introduce this panel, I want to again remind everyone why we're having a meeting that's devoted exclusively to the subject of equity. Every 10 years following the national census, federal, state, and local 
representational district boundaries are redrawn to reflect population changes and to ensure that communities of interest, the groups um, of people within a region that have a common cultural, economic, or social characteristics are maintained. In the United States, we like to think of ourselves as a democratic country, yet underserved communities have historically been unrepresented and even intentionally left out of the decision-making process and have subsequently been deprived of adequate representation. Lifting up the voices of people who have been left out is critical to cultivating a fair and inclusive process that advances equitable outcomes. Moving forward, a deliberate focus on equity is a critical step towards ensuring all communities get the representation they deserve for the decade to come. We've dedicated a great deal of time uh, to this next portion of the agenda because it is needed. Respectfully, please commissioners, hold your comments, hold your questions until the last speaker finishes. And even then I ask that maybe we limit ourselves to questions and comments. There'll be a lot of emotion behind what is going to be said. And perhaps the most thoughtful thing that we can do is listen. To guide us through this rich agenda, we have invited Dr. Rosa Perez to serve as our facilitator. As you will see, Rosa is amazing. She is a resident of Santa Rosa and a retired community college chancellor and president. She was uh, active in a variety of community organizations in her native San Francisco. Uh, she taught ethnic studies and devoted her career to equity in schools and colleges. And we're very fortunate to have her leading us through today's necessary discussion. Um, Dr. Perez, welcome, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Chairperson Sheffield. And thank you for setting up the discussion in such a way that underscores its importance to the redistricting process. And, and reflects the values that have been expressed by the county in terms of equity. And as you said, there's um, whenever the subject of equity comes up, people jump in and say, of course, it's important. But when you start getting into it, it can get very uncomfortable and difficult because it, it because of the history of uh, and the experiences of so many communities of, of color in particular. But if uh, one of the goals of the redistricting process in Sonoma County is to bring about further inclusion and increase the participation of communities that have, have, as you said, have historically been either intentionally harmed, excluded, and even controlled. It is important to start with hearing how we got to where we are and the stories that are embedded in the maps that we're looking at um, when, we, when we do the redistricting process. Um, <clears throat> this afternoon, we really are excited to bring to you a very powerful panel representing some key communities of color in Sonoma County. And it's been really, uh, for me, a, a, you know, it's, it's easy to say it's an honor, but it really has been an honor and an education to spend time with uh, each of the panelists, getting to know them and, and hearing about their experiences and their contributions um, to the county. Uh, you will notice on the panel that there are groups that are missing. Uh, for example, the Asian American community. And I just want to assure the commission that you know many efforts were made to reach out to a variety of communities and we that we could not get uh, represented today. Uh, we didn't have much time to assemble the panel, and so we have the six panelists that we have. But I want to assure you that in the process of community engagement, every effort will be made to uh, get the representation and voices of those that are not present today. After all, the equity goal of the county is to increase participation of all of its residents and to create a more respectful, inclusive future for Sonoma County. Uh, Chairperson Sheffield, you mentioned uh, listening. And I've got to tell you, in my own experience in working over the years in education with uh, Spanish speaking families in particular, <clears throat> I've noticed that in terms of getting involvement in education and hearing what people have to offer, say, and their concerns are. The more you show up and the more you listen and the more you follow through on some of the things you hear, the more they show up and the more they participate. Listening is an, a, a very powerful tool. 
Um, as you said, because we have six panelists, we've asked the presentations to be limited to 15 minutes where possible. And understand, we understand that 15 minutes is just a very short period of time. I really want to apologize for that because people have much more to say. But we hope that collectively uh, it will form a story of the county that will be uh, uh, very useful to the commissioners in its deliberation. So uh, let's get started. And we're going to begin with Sylvia Lemos, a member of a family that is well known to many of you for its contribution to civic life in our county. Sylvia works for the county doing strategic communication and is active in the leadership of Los Cien. Um, bienvenida, Silvia. Do you Gracias. Think you started? Gracias, Rosa. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to share information with you. So just a little bit about what I want to share about the past is our family moved here in the late 60s. Uh, and we moved here to help uh, my uncle Rosendo or Pancho Lemos start his concrete construction company, which was Lemos Concrete Construction. So that was in the late 60s, the reason we moved here. So our entire family, that means my grandfather, his sons, their families relocated from Fresno, California and settled into Roseland, specifically Sebastopol Road. So I remember that we first, our first house was on Sebastopol Road, kind of where Lombardi, Lombardi Court is at. Um, and then eventually my grandparents, um, they bought a home at the edge of Sebastopol Road off Olive um, on Carrington. Um, and let me see. Um, let me see. What other... So we, at the time, we knew all the Latino families in the community. Um, and when my parent, my grandparents bought the house off of Sebastopol Road, all of the neighbors in that area were white. And now if you go down there, it's all Latino and, and other communities. So my grandfather worked in the vineyard since around 1969, including he worked for Kundi Vineyards. I remember when he worked there. My grandmother worked at Point St. George Fisheries, which was on Boyd Street near Sebastopol Road. Um, a lot of recent immigrants worked there, especially ladies with limited English. Uh, my grandmother made many friends there uh, with ladies, not only from Latino America, but Portugal and other countries. Um, my parents bought their first home on Moreland in 1970. And at the time, Moreland was very diverse. Uh, there was a lot of white, black, Latinx, Native American families that lived there. So I remember my friends, um, you know, us getting together and playing with our black friends and our Native American friends and just everyone played together. Um, I remember riding our bikes down the street on Moreland past the Hells Angel um, house. There was a Hells Angel gathering house right where um, Andy Lopez Unity Park is at. Um, and I remember just riding our bikes really fast to the corner store, which is still there, Barry's Market on the corner. It was a store that was there. So um, we went to Bellevue Elementary, uh, where again, it was very diverse. But the one big difference there at Bellevue Elementary was that we had a Latino principal, Mr. Armando Flores, who served as a role model and a mentor to many of the school. So the message that we got from seeing that was that if a brown man can make it here, then we can make it too. You know, that's kind of a, a message that we received as, as children going to Bellevue Elementary when he was a principal and then superintendent as well. Um, nearly all of our shopping was on Sebastopol Road. There were not just one, there was two grocery stores. There was like an Alpha Beta type of regular grocer and there was Food City, which was a smaller kind of local grocer. And we also had Andy's Produce right across from Food City. There was also a teaching why there was a Santa Rosa shoe store, which now has moved to Cottingtown area. Uh, but there was no need to leave the community. We had all, you know, two grocery stores. A lot of our shopping could be done there on Sebastopol Road. And everything we needed was there. The only thing that's left there uh, now, from what I remember, is foster freeze. Because that same foster freeze, my mom used to take us in when we got good grades and we could get ice cream. If we got all A's, we could get a banana split. Otherwise, if we got A's and B's, we can get a cone, you know. So that was kind of special. Um, so as I said, all the Latino families knew each other. Uh, and even some in other communities, like we knew uh, families from Sebastopol, families from Hillsburg, from different areas. Um, and, and many times we saw each other on the weekends, especially because a lot of Latinos went to Hillsburg at the time on Sundays, because uh, the Raven Theater had Spanish movies, a lot of black and white and older movies in Spanish at the Raven Theater. So every Sunday was Spanish movie day. So we'd go and watch a matinee. And afterwards we'd go to Luna Market in Hillsburg. That's where we'd go buy any kind of... Um, Latino gro specific groceries, we can buy at Luna Market. Uh, the Luna family had that there in Hillsburg. Um, and then over the years, the demographics started changing. I remember that in the 80s, 
there was an increase of a lot of Latino um, communities. I don't know if it was due to immigration changes in the 80s or someone had mentioned maybe the earthquake in 89 caused a lot of families to move here. Um, but I remember that there was a big change in the 80s where a lot of more Latino families came here. And I remember my mom saying that she didn't know any Latinos in the area anymore because at one point you knew all the different families of different communities. Uh, but then sometime in the 80s, that kind of changed in the 80s. And around that same time uh, with the influx of students and residents in the school district, they decided to change boundaries um, where students from my junior high, which is Lawrence Cook Junior High, were divided in 1979. They were divided to three different high schools instead of feeding into one school like normally um, junior highs or middle schools do. And this really caused culture shock and was very oppressive to not only the BIPOC students at our school, but even white students that were from Southwood Santa Rosa that were immersed in the multicultural lives from elementary through, through, through junior high. Um, and this weekend, I actually reached out and talked to my junior high vice principal. Um, and we're still in connection with a lot of our educators from back in the day. And, I and he confirmed that the central district at the time had made the decision um, and learned, and then they learned, the, the vice principal at our junior high learned that, uh, that a lot of the students were going back to school leadership and they were complaining because they felt that they were being stereotyped by students and teachers at Montgomery High School. Well, that was our high school that we went to. Um, and so our junior high principal and vice president went to the high school around early 79, 80, in the early 80s, and told them about how our students were going back and how they were feeling. And so they can please change it so that our students would feel more included. So that was something that I had experienced with redistricting around school boundaries. And it really did affect a lot of students um, because when we, when we try to uh, continue our leadership um, and, and empower kind of activities from junior high into high school, it was really hard because uh, it was only a third of our population and we had to compete with other students from other areas that already had um, kind of a dynamics going in, in their favor. Um, so as I said, as, as Rosa became, um, as Rosen residents became more Latino, that's when I, start, I started to see the disinvestment on Sebastopol Road, Rosen community. Many businesses either closed or moved their businesses to other parts of town, like Sanders Shoes as, a, as an example, moved to Cunningham. But I remember as a, as a child going to Santa Rosa shoes there in, in Sebastopol Road and buying my saltwater taffy sandals and, and our shoes we would buy there. Um, one of the things that, that we all know is that the portrait of Sonoma, which was a, a measure that they did here in Sonoma County some years ago, really demonstrated to us that the area of Santa Rosa uh, really had different standards of living depending on where, where you live. For example, the Rosen area where I grew up in, Rosen, Moreland, that area, had um, had uh, similar kind of dynamics or similar statistics and, and data points to, uh, similar to Mississippi. Well, a few miles away, Bennett Valley had the standard of living and dynamics of Connecticut, which is the most economically advantaged state of the United States. So that's very different from Connecticut to Mississippi and it's only a few miles away, you know, but the standard of living is different. Um, that is very telling. Whether, whether a cause of redistricting or disinvestments or, lacks of, or a lack of tax base, it doesn't matter, it just doesn't make sense that, that this continues in our community. Um, community groups have to push and have pushed the city and county uh, for basic items. For example, the Moreland Neighborhood Action Team in the recent past lobbied for basic things such as sidewalks, lights, and bus stops. And this is because mothers are pushing strollers down a road with no bus stops or lights or sidewalks. Um, and the bus stops you know, had no covering, it was just the regular bus stop because it's a little bit more rural. But still, there's a lot of families that live there. And so um, the community action group lobbied for that in the community, and they did get it. So in the future, when I think about the future districts of Sonoma County, um, what I look at and think about is investments in our youth and our environments, schools, recreation, uh, enriched cultural environment. We need youth to feel empowered and know that, that and have pride of where they come from so they, they can embrace their own futures. I truly believe that things like cultural centers, ethnic studies, and anything else that will help our youth love who they are and where they come from will prepare them to tackle the future. Additionally, in addition to this, I feel that I'm holding institutions and systems accountable to see how their actions and inactions affect all communities um, are very important to kind of take into consideration. We need to kind of stop operating and making decisions in a vacuum and take other communities into consideration when we're making those decisions. Um, so that's, you know, just a little something I wanted to share. I have more, but I just wanted to leave some time for I know other people want to speak as well. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was very rich. And I'm glad that these, uh, this meeting is being recorded because uh, there, there's an awful lot of information you alone just shared. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to move on now to uh, Segreta Woodard, 
president of the Santa Rosa Sonoma County NAACP. She is a resident of Windsor, but has lived and been active throughout our county and has a wealth of knowledge about the African-American experience here. Um, she's quite the historian. I know other people say that there are others who, who have lived here a long time in the stories, but I, I tell you, Sagreta is one that uh, knows a lot of individuals throughout the county and can share with us um, some, I think, some very important words. So Sagreta, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me know if you have any problem hearing me. I adjusted my chair and I'm in a different position. <laughs> um, okay, great. Um, my family began to move to Sonoma County in the late uh, 50s. And my mother decided to move here around the 60, 1960. I stayed in San Francisco. I was determined to get as much of my education there as I could. And so in 1962, I joined my mother and family here. We lived at that time in Santa Rosa on, um, in the Sebastopol, uh, pardon me, uh, Stony Point Road and Scenic Avenue area. There was quite a few uh, African-Americans living there in that, that particular vicinity. Most of them were property owners. And when the uh, parents, uh, deceased, uh, then the uh, younger people moved away. Uh, it was not a, really a safe place to be in Sonoma County as a African American person. Um, I went, moved, we moved to um, Windsor and I went to Hillsburg High School. And in that particular time, um, it's quite uh, culture shock. Um, having come from San Francisco and never really being able to get my anchor in at the, in those early days, uh, because first of all, no sidewalks, no activities for the kids at school, no overlapping activities after school, no transportation. If you didn't have a car um, or you didn't have someone close by your neighborhood that had a vehicle, you did nothing but go to school and come home. In the schools, it was very difficult. I did go to uh, Cook uh, Junior High School for about a month. Um, and there was uh, double sessions. My sister went to school at six o'clock in the morning, and then I went to school at 12 noon. On that uh, trip back and forth to school, there was, was not unlikely that you would be accosted by a student in terms of verbal uh, profanities, um, just mistreatment. Um, and there was no authority. It seemed like the young people ran the show on the bus. Um, I was, it was interesting that the first person that actually um, introduced me to the climate of the area, because it, we moved north, but it seemed like we moved south. And the first person, young man, that um, took the liberty to make himself very present to me, um, ended up being the mayor of, of um, Petaluma at one point. And I, was, I, I marveled at that as an adult, that this person who actually had this terrible attitude toward anyone of any ethnicity was the, was the mayor of Petaluma. So it, as I moved forward, we moved to, as I said, moved to Windsor and I went to Hillsburg High School and I used, I sang a lot and we had a group and we were gonna sing at a rally at school. We had permission, our permission snip, slips to leave the high school and go to um, uh, the Greyhound bus station to get to Santa Rosa because we wanted to shop for our outfits. And we were stopped, not just stopped, but the police officer in Hillsburg ran up on the sidewalk to come in front of us and demand that we were, that personally, that I was a particular person they were looking for. And I had no knowledge of this. I'd only been there maybe a half a semester. And I was, I was totally surprised. I showed my, my pass. The other young ladies showed their past. 
And this guy was totally just belligerent and insistent that I was this person he was looking for. And it happened that one of the girls with me, her sister was the person that they named. And so, and she had to convince him, no, that she's not this person. This person you're looking for is my sister and she's at home. You know, she was, and she was actually over 18. She was the uh, person they were looking for was an adult person. So that was on the streets. Never did I want to be on the streets of Hillsburg after that. Uh, and that was the first time I had been walking down the streets of Hillsburg because I was transported by bus from H Windsor to Hillsburg every day. So we go on and I'm in, I'm going to class to get in the, in the school setting. I'm going to class routinely. And the first two, three days, I am pushed through two glass doors in the school uh, hallway. I reported it to one of my, um, one of the uh, uh, leaders. He was at, in fact, the vice, pre vice principal at the time. And he took very little interest in it. And although he was less than six feet away from where the incident happened every morning, this brings back a whole lot of stuff. And I, I'm really going to be dealing with that later and in my own personal life, because we had a gathering and this person did show up to the gathering of our old classmates a couple of weeks ago. So it's, it's kind of triggering right now. Um, this on this morning when I had spoken to the uh, vice president, pri vice principal, and I walked down the hall, these football players and they I tell you the football players had the run of everything. They were never uh, disciplined, and nothing ever happened to them in regards to what they had done. Uh, I walked up and then I was pushed as usual, but that time I retorted. I. I gave him one and he didn't do, he never did it again. But there was an African-American young man who had been in the, um, oh, in the uh, system because he, he had, he needed to, he had no parents. And I had identified him earlier as someone whose cousin I knew from San Francisco. And he came up and he asked me after I had been abused by this guy. He came up and he says, what's, what happened? What's going on? And I told him, I said, don't worry about it. I'll, I've taken care of it. Don't worry about it. Just go to class and I'll see you after school. Well, needless to say, he was expelled. He lost his foster home because this administrator did not take any action, but blamed anything that I don't even know what happened afterwards. But he took the fall for this football player and his group that had been accosting me every day. That's, that was my introduction to Sonoma County from feeling like I had moved south to the overt um, physical attacks, verbal attacks, and without any authority taking uh, the lead in doing any correction on it. I had been a a straight A student minus a couple of grades uh, throughout my lifetime. And I, it was just like, did I really wanna to continue to go to school? As a matter of fact, I had made it up in my mind I was gonna quit. There was a teacher who would not let me. And she engaged me in the places where she knew that I was interested, I, I did sing. And so I, I performed at a lot of um, outside events. And she watched me, kept me encouraged that I couldn't leave. Basically, the only thing that uh, she did basically stand between me and the door. I would not have abandoned my education because I'm a, a continuous learner. I would have gone to college regardless. But even in the process of trying to uh, apply for um, scholarships, at that time, we did not have the luxury of having our parents involved in the scholarship uh, review of our applications and stuff. We had to, the last person who had 
our applications was the principal of the school or one of the counselors. I turned in applications, and some of which never got out of that school because I found one in the garbage can. So um, when I got to the JC, there had been counselors from the JC um, that had come to make presentations and about the Doyle scholarship. And so um, when I got to the JC, which I came late because I spent the summer in Los Angeles and I didn't know how I was gonna go to school. I didn't have any money. And um, I came in about two weeks, I believe after registration had closed and all the classes were full, but uh, Mr. Oh gosh, I want to call him Mr. Doyle, but his was name was not Mr. Doyle. He just presented the Doyle scholarship to me at the school. But this gentleman asked me, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, I don't have any money, but I've got to go to school." And um, he facilitated my being able to. Uh, he gave me a card that said well, I'd go to these classes, even though they said they were full. And if the teacher in the class signed off on it, I was in the class. So that's what I did. I presented myself at each one of the classes. He loaned me through the, through the system, they loaned me money for the registration. And he had informed me that I had a scholarship, was one uh, given to me by one of the service organizations, which would continue, would continue as long as I continued in school. And that was enough to allow me to be able to buy my books. And so, um, uh, and then I found that I had scholarships, full ride scholarships available to me that I had been honored with that was never told to me by the school. So I basically forfeited with because lack of knowledge, those scholarships. I graduated from Healdsburg High School and I went to the JC. And so I didn't have, as again, didn't have a car, no transportation. And so I worked for room and board. And I worked, I happened to go to work for a, gentle, a gentleman by the name of John Upshur Breckenridge Smith, whose great, great, great grandfather had run against Lincoln. I lived on out in that off of Dryden Lane and I was able to see what it was like to have um, servants quarters in a house. I lived in the servants quarters. There was no heat back there, but I had a shower and a bathroom in the portion that I lived in. The um, lady of the house also was a teacher in at Santa Rosa High School. I was warned by her daughter not to eat anything she gave me out of the refrigerator. I, my job was, I worked for room and board and I prepped the breakfast, prepared the breakfast, prepped the dinners and did uh, house cleaning and things like that. And I, I have, as looking back, I have to really think that she, she had her issues but the main thing was she was not used to having someone of color, especially not a black woman, uh, up close and personal to her, except for her nanny. She kept reminding me she was raised by a nanny. And I was able to get through my living there, get a lot of the history around the Bryden Lane and the areas where the mansions are because these individuals, many of them came out of Tennessee and they were plantation owners. And they came here and built these homes that were like the homes that they lived in in the South. So we have an, a, a, a systemic, deep-rooted uh, environment that definitely cannot see and has a difficult problem seeing People of color, and I, I'm gonna say just people of color because it, it expands across um, any uh, shading. It, there's a um, colorism and no matter what ethnicity you are, you become more and more marginalized, the darker your skin. 
And that was and, and that was the the time of the 60s when we were fighting for uh, quote equal rights. And the idea was the fact that we the opinion was that we wanted to be integrated. We just wanted equal rights. We just we did was not the the uh, visual aspect that they um, militated against. We didn't want to, we didn't want to rub shoulders with anybody. We just wanted equal rights. So moving on in Sonoma County, I have encountered, as a matter of fact, one thing that came to me this morning that was somewhat, um, I won't say distressing, but for a person who was, at that time I hadn't moved here, I was 11 years old and I was babysitting for a neighbor of my aunt's. And um, it was on a Saturday when I babysat and I woke up in the morning and the, the the bedroom where I had stayed was facing the street. And I looked outside, I heard voices and I looked outside and I saw three gentlemen out there and they were making arrangements for some illicit behavior out there. And this was in South Park. Now, the gentlemen, there were three men there. One was African-American and the other two appeared to be Caucasian. I found out, like I said, at 11 years old, I did not know what I had heard. I didn't understand the things they were talking about, but I knew it was something that was kind of like not ratchety, you know, it was not good. I went to work for PG&E um, several, a few years later. And at that point, there just, this gentleman walks by and he looks familiar to me. And he, the first thing he asked me, you must know my, my brother, Dutch Floor. And I said, I don't know anybody, <laughs> you know? And he was very tall, large, but he had the face. He and his brother could have been twins, but he was at that time, uh, it had position as a sheriff or a deputy. He was head sheriff, Dutch Floor. And he gave permission for these two men to carry on things in this community, as long as they stayed out of Bennett Valley. That was his prerequisite. I did hear that. I didn't know where Bennett Valley was, but he said, as long as you keep it out of Bennett Valley. I'm 11 years old and here I am in, in my twenties going on my, and I'm, I'm looking at this guy and I'm saying, oh, that was the guy who gave permission for wrongdoing to come into this community. Okay, that too was came up in my consciousness today as I was look, thinking about things that needed to be said. So again, uh, we go on, I, I went to work for PG&E. I, I retired from there after 35 and a half years. When I came to work for them, I had a bounty on my head. The agreement was because they had been, had been determined that they were discriminatory in their hiring practices. I took a test. It took me two months to clear. They checked all the way back to my 11 year old babysitting job in San Francisco. And I was told that if I, they found anything that was not true on my application, they, they had the right not to hire me. Now, that was, what, that was my introduction to this hiring practice. They called my uh, fourth grade teacher, who was now the principal of the school, and they called um, the lady that I had done extensive babysitting for. for. They did not believe the, the money I made babysitting because it was actually more than I made at PG&E at 11 years old. And here I am in my 20s and I'm not making as much at 20 as I am, as I did at 11 years old. So each one of them called me and said they were so glad to find out where I was. They wanted to know what I was doing. And as I said, it took two weeks of physical examination in addition to calling these people back in my past. My, the doctor gave me a pelvic exam to sit in the office 
a pelvic exam. And when they finally released me, he gave me, the doctor told me some things that was none of his doggone business. And I go to back, I go to work. And I, for a few years, I didn't say anything. And then I asked some of the ladies, I said, did you get a pelvic exam? No, no one had gotten a pelvic exam but myself. And I had, my examination for employment was three days long, three days. I ran in place. They checked my blood pressure, my change in my um, uh, resting heartbeat and all that stuff, three days. Well, as I said, I had a bounty. I was told um, nothing, but one day I came in and I felt things felt a little strange. And I went and asked the hiring person there if there was anything wrong. I said, I felt that I felt uncomfortable when I walked into the office. And he told me, he said, I wish I had more employees. He said, I, he, I, his words exactly, I wish, if, I wish I had half of my employees as conscientious as you. And I said, okay, but I said, if something is wrong, if something is amiss, let, let me know, please. And he said, oh, there's nothing wrong. But I found out through one of the guys who worked in another office and they would come for these supervisor meetings that I, there was a bounty on my head. They were, I was not supposed to, they had um, decided that I was not supposed to be there past six months. I was a matter of fact, they wanted to get, they needed to get rid of me before six months. That way I could never be classified as a, 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 a permanent employee. And what the reality of the history there, I was the first black woman to be hired at PG&E north of the Golden Gate Bridge, period. The first black female employee. There was a lady who used to come in in the summertime when her children were out of school and they'd give her a temporary assignment. And she was satisfied with that. She had eight children when I met her. And, but there was, there was no credence given to anyone of, of any color. It was such that they decided to take a picture. They had hired two beta readers. And so they took for the, for the record, there were two male uh, meter readers and myself, we were the, the tokens in the organization. And it remained that way for many, many years. When I retired, just before I, well, when I retired, I was the only black employee in management. I had been, and I had to fight. I had to, I was fired four times, but I kept my fight up because I knew that all of, everything they did was to vindicate um, the decision made by those people when I first came into work. As I said, I was fired four times and the EEOC found them to be discriminatory in their practices. But instead of dealing with them directly, they asked me if I wanted to, if I would take a transfer to another area. Now at this point in time, I have five children. And I'm saying, why should I go and a commute hours every day and leave my five kids here in Sonoma County to be dealt with in the ways that I know that they can be dealt with in this community and risk and my way of thinking, their very lives. That's my reality of being here. And why did I, my, my family said, why do you stay? The rest of them, you know, they aged out and, and got out. I still have a number of family members. As a matter of fact, they've multiplied here. And sometimes I question the census because I know I, I have a substantial number of my family members to be counted in the census as African-Americans. Um, it, it's, 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 it's earth shaking to recount this. And my kids, even my daughter said to me a couple of weeks ago, she said, mom, you could have done so much better. Why did you stay here? I said, because I knew just like the reason I stayed at PG&E, because I knew that any other person of color 
was going to have triple time the difficulty I had because I was taught that I was somebody. I was taught that I had what it took to do anything I wanted to do. And so many people have not, and or so many people feel like they don't need to take it and they'll walk away from it. But by the time I realized this was a calculated plan by the administration and within this company, I said, I'm not going anywhere. And I would stand in the gap for all of those 13 other people, 13 other women in particular, who came through those doors and decided they couldn't take it. They actually were ones that wrote, um, signed the depositions that uh, caused the EEOC to determine that it was a discriminatory environment. It, not only that, it was a harassing environment. Uh, okay, so I, I retired. And uh, in, during this retirement, before my retirement, I engaged myself in the community uh, to an extensive level. I was uh, on the Commission on AIDS um, uh, executive board. I was on the executive board of the uh, uh, YWCA and the, uh, what used to be People for Economic Opportunity, the CAP uh, organization. I started off as gra Operation Grassroots, went door to door throughout the community from Grayton, Sonoma, all the areas. We rotated in and out to do statistics that proved to Sonoma County that there were actually poor people here. I went to homes that I didn't never, I didn't know even that there were homes that looked like these homes in existence anywhere. I had never seen anything like it. It was a migrant farmer homes. And in the, I think in the eighties, as I was working for pg and I had um, an opportunity to uh, help to get the migrant workers um, this, uh, Head Start program uh, streamlined. And so that's, that was one of the reasons that, that something had changed in the migrant worker uh, plan from year to year. And that's when the migrant workers began to stay here. Uh, it's, it's been a long, it's been a long journey. And I, I'm, not, I'm not tired yet. That's why I came on in terms of uh, putting myself, making myself available to run for president of the NACP, because I know there's more work to be done. And I feel that um, having seen and been involved with the NACP as a teenager, where those mentors that came alongside me walked into the office many times and says, is everything okay? How are you doing? They looked, they, they were present. And I think with the way things were going here, anybody could disappear. <laughs> Anyone could disappear. And I had, fortunately, I had people who, family members, as well as people I'd met in the community that looked out for me. Um, and I, I could go on, but I, I won't. It's, it's, um, it's not quite, at this point, it's not quite cathartic, but I'm, I've got to work on that cathartic piece because uh, like I said, there's a lot to be done and I'm determined as long as I'm here to be in the midst of it. So thank you very much. And thank you, Segreta. <clears throat> thank you um, for your time and for your honesty. And I know that's your personal story, but from what you've told me and others, it, you're, it's a sample of the stories of many of the African-American residents in, in the county. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Dr. Danielle Malpica, who is professor of Chicano and Latino studies at Sonoma State. Um, uh, he's also a sociologist and has, I think, some very important contributions to make uh, from his work as an academic and also a resident in the county. Dr. Malpica. Thank you, Rosa. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, my name is Daniel Malpica. I've lived in Sonoma County for 15 years. I've lived in Rona Park and also Katari. And I moved from LA to Los Angeles, uh, from, from LA to Sonoma County. I've been asked to talk a little bit about the census and what is it that we're actually gonna be perceiving in the census 
and specifically the role of Latinos in Sonoma County. So that's more or less what I plan to do. Um, so I wanna start off with this idea. Uh, the census that will come out in 2020, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, will reveal something that we already know. Many of us who actually study these sort of demographic changes that one, whites are gonna become less once we see that um, result. Two, that we live in a multiracial society and that browns will become uh, many, much more important in California and also in the county, in Sonoma County. We also will know that whites are aging. This is really, really important. And that racial minorities are part of the youth population. So the future of Sonoma County, it's basically young folks. And many of those folks are in fact, people of color. Um, we also know this, that uh, racial minorities will be the primary demographic engine of the nation's future growth. And of course, of the county. If we're just thinking about the county, among Latinos, we're roughly gonna be talking about 28%, almost 30% of Latinos in Sonoma County. And whites, we're talking about 58%. Let me talk a little bit about the role of Latinos in Sonoma County. And I really wanna reference issues dealing with economy, politics, and then education. Let me first start off with the economy. Latinos not only are here, but they are contributing. And this is really, really significant. Of course, in agriculture, um, we all know that for those of us who have lived here, uh, I always tell my students, imagine a fine Merlot from Sonoma County. Can that Merlot or, or Sauvignon Cabernet, can that wine compete in an international scale if it wouldn't be for the Latino labor force? Of course, it would not be possible. In construction, Latinos are also a very significant force. Of course, in entrepreneurship, this is the case. Small businesses have flourished tremendously from the previous census. And the most important thing to sort of deliver specifically to this audience is Latinos have the largest labor force participation than any other group. And we should always remember that even more so than whites. So Latinos are working and they're working day and night. And this is really, really important. And then lastly, in terms of economic clout, I really wanna mention this. Um, with the growing earning of Latino households, they are a major contributors to the US tax revenue. So this is key also, Latinos pay taxes and we all benefit from this. This is also very significant. Politically, um, Latinos, uh, many of them who recently have gained eligibility to vote will be extremely important in recent and very future elections. And this group is gonna be the new constituents. So this is very, very important. How can we better serve and allocate resources to this population? In terms of education, I have a couple of remarks. Um, if you wanna see the demographic changes in Sonoma County, just go to elementary school and you'll see exactly what that looks like. So when we're talking about K to 12, um, almost half of the Latino population uh, of the students are, are Latino. And this is also the case in California. But of course, there's a lot of things that we need to improve in terms of a lot of educational gaps, um, specifically in high school. The high school dropout rate is very significant among Latinos and that needs to improve dramatically, specifically if we compare it with their white Asian peers. And some, this is what I really wanna pitch to the audience today. Latinos are here to stay. There are workers, there are students, there are patients, there are constituents, there are neighbors, there are also our fellow colleagues at work. There are also fellow church and synagogue goers. There are boyfriends, there are girlfriends. And what's really, really important is this. In this discussion about redistricting, Latinos have to have a voice. They have to have a presence. This is really, really key. And the last thing that I would like to convey to this audience is this. If Latinos succeed, all of us will succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. That was powerful <clears throat> uh, and much appreciated. Uh, we now have a, 
presentation from another academic, uh, Dr. Brenda Flies with Hawks, who is a psychology professor at Santa Rosa JC and a member, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, Brenda, Sla Salagi, Eastern mm -hmm. Cherokee Nation, Bird Clan. Dr. Flies with Hawks has been a leader in the Native American community locally and, and an important contributor to Native American studies and its development. We welcome her voice and thank her for joining us. Osio Asidan and Dawi Tahishu Lehepehte Ishne Wahaope Ikinate. Um, hello and good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation to be in the room today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Perez, for facilitating this discussion and commission members and uh, my fellow panel colleagues. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, on the panel with you. And I've read your draft of equity principles and um, they are a beginning. So I appreciate that you are uh, thinking uh, heartedly uh, in regards to equity. I share today from my lived experiences as a native woman in Sonoma County. I've been here since uh, 1980. I relocated here uh, right after graduation uh, in the spring semester of 1980 from the um, University of Texas. And I came relocated here to come to graduate school. And I chose Sonoma State because in this area, because of the native community that was here, I was accepted into Berkeley as well as Humboldt State University. And I chose uh, this area because of the indigenous population, specifically the Native American population. Uh, when I came here, a lot of things that I heard in the beginning was welcome uh, to Caltown, meaning Santa Rosa. And I uh, was told it's very white. Uh, I was given uh, information about how to guard myself, protect myself, especially as a woman. Uh, I lived in Katadi for a year when I first came here, close to uh, Sonoma State. Then I relocated to Santa Rosa, uh, where I have made my home since then. Uh, I acknowledge I am not a California uh, Indian, as uh, uh, Dr. Perez introduced me. Uh, we have an intertribal native community in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. And as a Salaki Eastern Cherokee, I am a member of that community using native community resources, serving and working for our local indigenous community. And I currently live off West College on the territorial homeland of the Sonoma people, uh, Southern Pomo people, excuse me. I wanna talk about the real practical and meaningful ways for historical changes in demographics and communities of interest in so Sonoma County uh, for our Native American uh, community, speaking from my uh, lived experience. One thing that I would like to suggest is that one of the things that this commission or this, the supervisors and those like yourself need to do is to establish a relationship and collaborate with local tribal leadership. For example, uh, uh, Chairperson uh, Dino Franklin with the Kashai Banapomo uh, Indians from Stewart Point's Rancheria, Chairperson Scott Gabaldon, the Mishwawapo tribe of Alexander Valley, Chairperson Greg Saris with the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria, Coast Miwok, and Southern Pomo, and Chairperson Mar Margie Mejia uh, with the Lytton uh, Band of um, Pomo uh, Indians. I think it's really important that we talk about neighbors and when we talk about um, uh, redistricting and knowing who our neighbors are and knowing where our indigenous uh, uh, brothers and sisters make their neighborhoods and where they live. And we're scattered about like uh, most folks are, but you, if when you go into the uh, neighborhoods of the fairgrounds, the Roseland district, West Santa Rosa, uh, areas of Santa Rosa Avenue, Piner Road area, uh, even some areas of the downtown area. And um, as some of my uh, co-panelists have already mentioned, uh, there are pockets in Hillsburg. A lot of people think, you know, Hillsburg, and it is very white run, uh, but it operates on the backs of indigenous people. Um, I think this, Second thing is I would suggest to you is that in order for you to understand redistricting through the eyes and lens of native people is that you need to, uh, when you're having discussions about redistricting and services, 
um, and legislation that you need to talk to each other and you need to talk about Native American issues. You need to know what's going on in our community. You need to know that our concerns are about land rights. Uh, we want water protection is huge for us, food sovereignty. Um, the impact of the wild, uh, wildfires, the fires that we've been having uh, previous before 2017 and specifically since 2017, they affect our households much differently than most. And I'm not, uh, again, taken away from anyone who's lost their homes and lives. Uh, but what I'm talking about is the aftermath of those wildfires and access to affordable housing, for example. Uh, the homeless community members that we have, food bank distribution centers, um, uh, and those ha having access to the food bank distribution centers, uh, sometimes the days and times are not uh, conducive to uh, our folks and, and our folks having uh, even uh, transportation to get over to where the food bank distribution centers are set up for that day. Um, uh, delivery for those community members might be something that could be talked about when you're talking about redistricting for the folks that have no transportation, no way to get to the food banks if they wanted to get over to them. And then recovery and resiliency. Uh, I think is important to talk about uh, the impact of recovery and resiliency, again, from power outages, the fires, and the impact on our indigenous neighborhoods and the recovery. I also think it's important to talk about health care including our mental health, uh, very particularly, uh, you know, we've always struggled in our community with suicide. And I know that we don't have a market on that. It affects all of our uh, uh, families and all of our community, but in the indigenous and our native American community, suicide is at a high rate. We, we lose a lot of our youth and we lose a lot of our elders, very specifically since uh, COVID uh, and some of that is uh, connected to the COVID isolation. Uh, we also have uh, our murdered and missing children that are a part of our community. It's a daily discussion. Uh, the results of uh, bordering schools we're still living with and the recovery of our, our uh, family members that were murdered uh, in those uh, boarding schools uh, here in California. Uh, employment is another uh, area that I would like for you to think about. Uh, for indigenous people, it's about access to jobs. We want to work, we will work, and we do work. Uh, even though the stereotype is that we're lazy, uh, that's not true. It's about having access to jobs. It's about transportation to a job. If you don't have transportation, if you don't, if you're homeless and you don't have an address, and you don't have, uh, there's an assumption that's made that everybody has uh, a cell phone. That's just not true in our community. Um, Bus transportation routes, making those routes more equitable, especially regarding the time of day and the number of buses, buses uh, that serve those routes in our indigenous communities. If you look at those, you're gonna see some inequities going on in regards to uh, other areas of uh, Sonoma County and Santa Rosa. The bus routes and the days and time are very different. Uh, so. We have a community that often, uh, you know, we are working poor, not all of us. Uh, I'm very blessed. I'm educated with credentials after my name. And, and I had, you know, very good job with income. I worked very hard for that. Uh, but many of my on uh, family members, indigenous people here, they are really working poor. I want to impress upon you that there is we come from different cultural values, as you've heard from my colleagues that spoke so precious before me, giving you very personal examples. We come from different cultural values. We come from multiple languages. Indeed, um, we live in two worlds. Uh, I may be educated. English is not my first language. I did not speak English until the first grade. Um, my parents and my grandparents, uh, I'm first generation uh, English language learner. And um, I feel like I have lived in two worlds all my life. And that has not changed since I came to Sonoma County. Um, I encourage you to think about what you do with your funding, designate funding and uh, visit programs that serve native communities. We have our Sonoma County Indian Health Project here that is our hub 
for how uh, we get message out and how we serve our local community. But your group and groups like you can support legislation for federal and state fundings that would support our Sonoma County Indian Health Project and increase our revenue there. Our Yakima, which uh, we have a lot of programs there and gatherings and events. Our California Indian Museum and Cultural Center over on Avi Aviation Boulevard. Uh, again, our different reservations, Stewart Point, as I mentioned, Round Valley Reservation, our Hoplin uh, uh, Reservation. Uh, and then get to know us through attending, uh, you know, we have our Native American celebration uh, at the Santa Rosa Junior College Day Under the Oaks. You, you need to know who we are. You're not going to know who we are. You're not going to know how to uh, write us into your legislation and, and have an impact on this redistribution process if you don't know who we are. Uh, come to our October Indigenous Day celebration, for example, our Native American uh, Heritage Month. Uh, our indigenous gathering that we have at Sonoma County uh, Fairgrounds. And I'd like to touch on uh, uh, Native American education programs as my, uh, the previous uh, speaker did as well, my colleague. Um, we're talking about, uh, he talked about and referenced improving the educational gap. Uh, I agree with him wholeheartedly for all indi indigenous uh, ethnic people. And um, it's about equitable access to education for Native American. We have Native American students who want to go uh, to school and go over here to the community college, to the JC, uh, but it's about access and getting in. It's about finances. Uh, if you have an impact and can support no fee tuition for the first two years of college education, for example, at Santa Rosa Junior College, you could have a huge impact there. Support state and federal uh, and local for, uh, forgiveness of educational financial aid loans. You have the authority and you can, you can make an impact there. And then Native American scholarships through Santa Rosa and, and Sonoma State University foundations. And we have a, a, a Native American summer bridge program that works to bridge students from high school to Santa Rosa Junior College. You can support those programs. I encourage you to learn about local Native American history. Um, a couple examples I'll give you is Thanksgiving. We call it un-Thanksgiving. We don't celebrate that. It's a day of mourning for Native peoples. So be mindful of that. And in the education system, if you're a parent or a grandparent or an auntie or an uncle, or you have children that you know in the system, please talk to the educators and have them to stop making those headbands with an Indian feather uh, in our elementary with our students. Uh, it still happens. You may think it doesn't, but it does. Another thing that I'd recommend is changing the calendar holidays to reflect honoring indigenous people. For example, let's change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Let's add Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta's holiday. Let's honor indigenous people by letting the children grow up and see holidays that celebrate who they are and recognize Sonoma County as an intertribal native community. Write legislation through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. Revise current legislation to reflect diversity, equity, and inclusion. Don't just talk about it. Write a land acknowledgement statement. Post it on your website and open your meetings, just like this one, acknowledging the indigenous land that Santa Rosa and Sonoma County is settled on. And find out whose land you're living on and start acknowledging. You may say, well, how important is that? It's very important because then you're showing that you are sensitive to, you know that you're on stolen land and it's a way to acknowledge your local indigenous people. Finally, in closing, I'll say actively recruit. Recruit and encourage native citizens of Santa Rosa and Sonoma County to run and serve on the board of supervisors uh, so that they can, you can have our voice on a regular basis, that we're visible, that we, you, you do want us to be a part of the decisions and legislation that's made. Don't just talk about it, recruit us. Go out into our communities and talk to our leaders and talk to the next generation. Uh, give them hope and encourage them that they too can be a mayor of Santa Rosa. They can sit on uh, the uh, supervisor. They can be a supervisor of Santa Rosa and they can be a president of Santa Rosa Junior College. So I implore you to make a commitment uh, to be action focused uh, and go beyond uh, talk. So Wado, Machete, and I thank you so much uh, for including me today and giving me the opportunity to share.
teach sister fly with hawks. That was an incredible summary. <clears throat> and as I, as I said earlier, thank goodness we are recording this because what you said was an awful lot. I don't know of anyone else who could have done that sort of summary. Really want to thank you for the time you took to prepare it and share it with us. Um, we will now hear from Magali Larque, Program Manager at Latino Service Providers. She is a well-known community activist and organizer and has been in this community for a long time. So Magali, please uh, uh, join us. Thank you, Rosa, and thank you for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, awesome, thank you for the thumbs up. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Rosa. As she mentioned, my name is Magali Tonancin Marque, pronouns she, her, ella. Um, I've lived in Santa Rosa, uh, South Park specifically, my entire life. Um, my mom moved here from Mexico City to Santa Rosa to South Park, which she also called Cowtown. I've known that my entire life. So moving from Mexico City to Santa Rosa was a huge culture shock for her. And then when I went to Mexico City for the first time, it was a huge culture shock for me. I was like, where are all the cows? I miss them. <laughs> but that's that's where I've lived my entire life. And my mom um, raised me in the same neighborhood my entire life. So I have very deep roots in South Park, which I love. Um, my mom, when she moved here, first worked for Women Against Rape, which is now um, the Women's Rape Crisis Center Verity and then EOPS and then the Santa Rosa Junior College where she's now a professor um, in history. And she was getting her master's in history while pregnant with me, while trying to get her citizenship. Um, and I grew up in a single parent household. So I really owe everything that I've been doing to my mom who's such a strong individual and definitely a pillar in this community as well. Um, but on to me. Um, so as I mentioned, I've lived in South Park my entire life for 28 years, exactly. Um, a little bit about my growing up when I was in elementary school, I went to Doyle Park Elementary, which if you know now is I think the French Academy. So changing over Doyle Park to the French Academy was, was really rough for me because I felt like my school had changed. It was not what I was accustomed to. And and I definitely felt underrepresented afterwards, after the change. But while I was going to Doyle Park, um, it was pretty diverse, but there was still a few racist microaggressions from a few of my teachers that I learned as an adult were microaggressions now that I knew the word and was able to, to talk about my experiences. Um, for example, I have a hard name. I used to go by Tonansin Magali instead of Magali Tonansin. And during that time, my teachers didn't really want to call me that name. They had a really hard time with it. And instead of learning how to say my name that is deeply rooted in my culture as I am, they tried to come up with nicknames for me. So that was always like a really hard time for me in school. And they definitely tried to make me take ESL classes without testing because of my name and because of my mom's thick Mexican accent. Um, during that time, I would also take the bus or I would walk home from school with my friends and, and we all kind of lived in the same neighborhood, which was really nice. So I was able to walk with all of my friends in like the fifth and sixth grade, even though it was a few miles away, but we all kind of walked together as a cohort, which was really nice. Um, and then in middle school was a huge culture shock for me. I went to Slater Middle School, which I, which I hope you all know Slater Middle School, it's over um, kind of by Bennett Valley area, like around like Spring Lake, Howarth Park. And that was a huge culture shock. I felt really isolated, um, but I had like my little niche of friends. So it wasn't too bad and it was just for two years. And then I went to Montgomery High School, which was the biggest culture shock that I, I had ever felt. Um, I was definitely feeling discriminated against, very shameful of where I came from um, because I didn't live in these huge houses like my friends from Bennett Valley and Kenwood lived in. And I had a different name and I had different friends that didn't look like everybody else. And as I continued through Montgomery, I kind of lost my original niche of friends who are BIPOC individuals who I was raised with at Doyle Park and specifically through South Park because I noticed that they were getting into a little bit more trouble and I didn't really know like where to fit in. I wanted to do well in school, but I actually did really, really poorly in school because I didn't feel supported through my teachers or through my groups of friends or um, anyone kind of, no one was really rooting me on except for my family. Um, but during that time, I, I, lost a, I, lost, I lost a couple of friends, went to suicide, who was my 
um, neighbor from across the street. And then I also lost one to a drug overdose who was my neighbor from two streets down. And that was all in high school. And that was like one of the biggest shocks that I ever felt was, wow, the people that I grew up with as a child, I lost them both. And I didn't feel supported in my school, unfortunately. And I didn't feel like the problems that they had gone through were really recognized and or talked about. So that was really heartbreaking for me to see the fall of like my childhood friends and, and feel like I couldn't do anything about it. Um, after Montgomery, I went to the Santa Rosa Junior College, which I absolutely love. I spent three years there. My first year was just trying to get like my classes out of the way. I was like, I don't really want to be in school. I don't, I'm kind of over this. It's a junior college. Everyone knows my mommy. So I'm like, oh, I don't know if I really want to be here. It was, it was a little tough, but then I accidentally walked into a sociology class and I was not supposed to be there. I didn't know the classrooms. It was really hard for me. I walked into a sociology class and sat down and realized I was in the wrong class like halfway through but was so invested in what was being taught in the material because it was sociology of modern problems and everything that I had experienced in my life as a woman of color was being put into words and through theory in this class and that was the first time I felt represented in a classroom by a woman of color in that classroom so that's kind of where I had a big turning point in my life and then I lost another best friend to suicide that same year. And that was a huge turning point in my life that made me want to be a better person and be better for my loved ones and those around me and to become a resource and a pillar of change. So I, I definitely got my life together and applied to a bunch of schools and ended up at Humboldt State University where I spent two years of my life um, getting two bachelors, one in sociology and one in psychology. Um, Dr. Brenda flies with Hawks definitely pushed me to the psychology side, one of the best teachers I've ever had at the junior college, um, and to be represented in the subject matter that I was learning in. So I wanted to specifically surround myself in mental health and the intersection between that and nature, because at Humble, I felt so connected to nature, something that I hadn't really felt in Sonoma County, even though we have so many recreational parks, so many places to go to, I didn't really have that growing up. My mom would drive me to different parks, but I didn't have that in my neighborhood. I had this, the Martin Luther King Jr. Park, but I'll mention in a little bit why that was really tough for me to go to that park. Um, but I really wanted to focus on mental health and, and being engulfed in nature and how that can be better for, for me as a person, but also for my community, which I wanted to go back to. So after Humble, I moved back to Santa Rosa. I worked a little bit um, and for the last two years, Almost three years now, I've been working at Latino Service Providers, a local nonprofit here in Sonoma County, and I absolutely love it. Um, my colleagues actually have pushed me and motivated me and supported me throughout my master's. So I'm at my second year at the University of San Francisco, getting my master's in public health specifically and behavioral health. And I'm really grateful because it's given me the tools to amplify the voices in my community, especially through policy and representation. And I'm here today to you know, to kind of bring a voice um, and amplify the voices of my undocumented brothers and sisters in Santa Rosa, but specifically within my community of South Park, um, who are often left out of the narrative and because they're not spoken for or can't vote or are misrepresented, underrepresented or not even represented at all. So that's, that's the demographic that I'm particularly very interested in and invested in because it's my demographic. It's, it's who my mom was. It's who my uncles were. So that's, what I would like to see from this initiative, especially through the redistricting, is using our positions, using our platforms to amplify their voices and empower them. Um, and currently right now, I'm actually interning at the Santa Rosa Office of Community Engagement and working on the declaration um, as racism as a public health crisis in Santa Rosa. And one of the biggest things I'm looking at is the redistricting of Santa Rosa and how that contributes to social determinants of health. And what we as professionals and as um, people in within our communities of color can do to help to amplify the voices of our communities and bring social cohesion. Um, so as far as my neighborhood goes, as I mentioned, I've lived in South Park my entire life <laughs> with, a, with moving just around a few couple of times for school. Um, not much has changed from like, well, Azteca market, which was the marketplace behind my house is now Asian market. Um, so like the same great foods, still the same guy who's been working there, who knows me pretty well, um, always says my name wrong, but he's amazing. Um, 
I really just wanted to mention the park. The park has changed a lot. Um, when I was younger, I didn't really feel safe going to the park. As I mentioned, my mom would drive me to like Spring Lake or Taylor Mountain or, or different parts of Sonoma County where I could feel free and hike and go to the parks. But we would rarely go to my park. And I always thought that was really strange. But when we would go by, it was trash. There was a lot of homelessness. There were a lot of drugs. There were a lot of gangs. There was a lot of tagging. And I hated seeing that. And it was really rough for me. And especially in elementary school, sometimes, you know, I would go out with my friends and, and they would tag some of the, some of the walls in the park. And, you know, that's actually where I learned that I loved art <laughs> when I got a spray can bottle. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm really good at this, but I should not be doing this on this because it's really bad. And my mom will get mad at me. So I, I kind of learned that I loved art that way, but I didn't like putting it on places that it was not supposed to be on. And that's a lot of what I saw in, in South Park was tagging our neighborhood fences. And I have one of the biggest fences in South Park. So it absolutely broke my heart every time someone would tag our fence, no matter how many times we painted over it, it would still get tagged. And I'm like, oh. it was really, really frustrating. And there was also a lot of policing um, that I met, that I saw and I, and I still see today. But one of the biggest memories I had was one of my neighbors was a survivor of intimate partner violence. And there was a lot of policing always going on at her house, but it was always 10 to 15 minutes in and out and not much ever being done. Um, unfortunately, that family moved away. So we lost that connection with them. And, and I have a new family that moved in who have just been absolutely amazing, but it just really broke my heart that we weren't able to do more for that family and that there wasn't other support systems set in place. And our neighbors didn't know who else to call besides 911 who essentially I feel like did nothing for that family or for that situation. Now there's, you know, with the rising of the pandemic, there's still a lot of homelessness. And, and I feel like I could be doing more as a citizen, as a resident of South Park to support these individuals in finding equitable housing resources that understand homelessness more and can be more open to the multifaceted dimensions that there are surrounding homelessness and just being more empathetic. Um, there's less tagging, less gangs, I feel like. It feels a lot safer to me. And I'm not sure if that's just because an adult and I'm able to, to see what feels safe and what doesn't versus when I was a child, I kind of relied on others to tell me what felt safe. Um, there's, there's, it just feels like there's more of an effort being made. The, the park especially is a lot cleaner. There's a neighborhood trash pickup once a month that I'm a part of. Um, I went to the park a while ago and there was a four square game going on with teams already set up, which I would have never seen when I was a child. There's more kids at the park. There's Aztec dancing on Friday nights. There's kids on the bikes that go around and there's actually lights for once. When I was younger, there weren't really good lights set up at the park. And for once the basketball hoops actually have nets. So it's it's all these little things that I actually feel like are being cared for. And I think that has a lot to do with our community, my community in particular, kind of coming together and asking for these things and feeling empowered to ask and receive them and holding um, our policymakers and, and our city council members and those who are in charge of parks uh, accountable for, for delivering what they promise when they're being elected. So I really appreciate that. And I've been able to see that. Um, our neighbors are volunteering more. They're going to more pop-up events. I know through Latino service providers, I've worked a vaccine event and I was just like in tears by how long the line was to get the vaccine. And I knew so many of my neighbors. So that made me so happy to see because you know, when you can like recognize the people in the lines, you're like, oh, I know that person, I know that person. We're doing the right form of outreach. We're reaching the people that we're supposed to reach in these hard to reach areas. Um, and then what I've really appreciated is my neighborhood coming together and deciding that they wanted murals. So what I was able to do this last year with a fellow artist of mine, Martin um, Zuniga, and a few of my interns through my work, we were able to make a beautiful mural on one of the buildings that I actually used to tag as a child. So it was a full circle moment for me. Um, and we were really intentional on in representing those in our community who we saw. So we had the paletero, the guy who brings us ice cream, kids on bikes, kids playing basketball. It was, it's the heart of South Park because there is so much heart in South Park, my neighborhood that I absolutely love. Um, what I hope to see in the future is South Park being a multicultural community of engaged residents living in a clean, safe, and well-resourced neighborhood. That's all I want. 
And the issue right now is that we're lacking co social cohesion, like throughout Sonoma County, throughout Santa Rosa, but sometimes in my neighborhood as well. And there's such a loss of connectedness right now, especially with the pandemic. It's made it even harder to feel connected and a sense of belonging and a, an ability to advocate for the resources that we all deserve. Um, one of the biggest goals that I see for redistricting, I think would be for residents to use their collective power to advocate for improved safety, especially in the streets and in the parks, which I, I heard of some of the other panelists mention, to also build relationships with civic and community leaders. Um, there's so many community leaders that really need to be invited to the table. And I know that sometimes it's hard and we all have stuff going on, but this is really important to me. And I think that if I can help to make this more available for others, I think we can all do our part in that. Um, also to learn how policy changes are made. This is something that's new to me and that I definitely want to introduce to others. Um, you know, what's that saying? Like when you learn, you actually know something when you're able to teach it, I wanna be able to do that. And to meet city leaders and be heard and, actual, and see actual change being made. So those are the few goals that I want to see with the redistricting. And, and if I can support in any which way, I would be more than happy to. And I'm just really appreciative that I was able to be a part of this panel with um, my esteemed panelists. You were all so amazing and I was deeply moved from, from all the stories you had to share. So that's it for me. Thank you. Oops, I don't mute myself. Just saying, Don Ansin, you were well-named <clears throat> one of the most powerful Aztec goddesses that we have. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your comments on support of undocumented residents of our county and also for, for bringing to life the complexities of your own neighborhood. I think that was very helpful to the group. So uh, <clears throat> closing the comments from the panelists is someone who really needs no introductions. I'm gonna start by saying, Herman, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, okay, give it a try. You're the last one. You're a powerful speaker. You have a lot to say. Herman J. Hernandez, we welcome you. Gracias, Rosa. And buenas tardes. Good afternoon to the whole committee, and and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, what an inspiration to 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 hear the voices here this afternoon. Um, uh, I'm I, I'm just trying. I'm stuttering a little bit, and I don't normally do that. Just to just to be able to to see where I start, but the passion in the heart and the feeling that I feel here inspires me to just elevate, no matter how old I am, to continue to move forward with all of you. Um, uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I was born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, my dad uh, migrated from El Salvador uh, in 1936, worked for the railroad. Uh, then back in 1940 with my mom, they went back to El Salvador where my two sisters were born. They came back in 1946. And in 1947, they started vacationing in the Russian River community. Um, I started, uh, uh, I was born in 1950. And at three years old, I was already vacationing as well in the Russian River community. Uh, I, I'm pretty unique in a sense that uh, I don't ever do anything normal is what I'm told. And in this situation here, I live and I represent uh, and I experience two communities. Uh, I live in Guerneville. I moved in Guerneville in 1970. Um, I've been here for 51 years. Uh, and it always seems that when I share my story that we were the first Latino business we were the first Latino realtors in Sonoma County, and I was the first Latino Rotarian in Sonoma County. It was the first baby steps in moving forward. The first baby steps in, in some situations where uh, as I grew and I try to learn uh, and to, to, to be at the cutting edge of my profession, uh, there were times and there were moments uh, where I felt and experienced limit access, limit privilege. But that didn't hold me back. Um, uh, maybe because I didn't give it much time to think about, but I gave more time to move forward to serve my, com my whole community. Um, when I first moved, moved to the river area, I didn't know anybody. 
uh, I gradually started to kind of go into the community, the volunteer. And there were a lot of individuals that were willing to have me uh, be able to volunteer and do the heaviest back laboring work that I loved, I enjoyed for the benefit of those in need. And so, you know, when, when, when my journey grew in the Russian River community, little did I learn that I would experience, when I talk about being the first, the first historic 1986 flood that brought our whole community uh, together. And, and what I wanna say is no matter how much we disagreed when there was disaster, we were all there to support each other. And I just, uh, I, you know, I, I gave a lot of reflection to what we were gonna be speaking about and, and what, what I wanted to be able to deliver. And I think one of the biggest things was that there was a fear uh, for me to leave the river area as I grew. I felt more comfortable. It became my comfort zone. But as I started to kind of filter out or filter upriver, at times it felt without a paddle, I would go into Santa Rosa, participate in different type of organizations, whether it was Russian River, I mean, excuse me, uh, Rotary, whether it was anything to do with my association uh, of realtors uh, and other organizations, I never felt the confidence and the security that I was qualified enough. Uh, th that was one experience. The other was where I wanted to go and feel comfortable. And I think Sylvia talked about it. I did my mandado. I'd go to the grocery store there on Sebastopol Road at Coco's back in the mid late 70s. I migrated up to Healdsburg to Luna Market, Adele Luna, who was one of the, was the first mayor of Healdsburg, uh, had a radio station. Me and my dad were, would uh, uh, put our advertising in the radio station to do taxes, to do, we, my dad was an insurance broker, a real estate broker. My mother was uh, uh, involved in immigration and uh, taxes. Uh, we somehow uh, got related with Corbell Winery. Uh, we did all their immigration, all their taxes. Uh, Corbell, for a period of time, had what they call Cowboy Town. Cowboy Town was the destination for families, uh, um, uh, families with children. And then the bunkhouse out in Laughlin Field had about 25 to 30 uh, uh, workers, all single men. They all lived in, in that area. And then in 1972, Corbell changed. They started to subcontract. They gave an opportunity to all these individuals to start working inside. Uh, many of them decided to, to do that. Uh, they worked for several years until they built up their retirement. And then they went into where I mentioned we were the first Latino business. Then all of a sudden you started seeing Latino business generating throughout all Sonoma County. Um, it, it's been, um, uh, for me, it, 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 like I mentioned, I just wasn't sure if I was ready for Santa Rosa uh, or whether the big city was ready for me. And um, the opportunity I had was similar to this, to be able to come together with different inspiring and energetic Latino leaders only to talk about some unfortunate situation that they had experienced and why they were coming together. I was coming from the Russian River. Uh, at times, I, someone would ask me, where are you from? I noticed that when I used to say Guerneville, there was an expression in their face, but I just couldn't figure out why. Later, I said, they'd ask me and I'd say, I'm from the Russian River. But, but a big turning point in the river community was back in 1977, when Peter Pender uh, bought a resort and converted and spent well over a million dollars to make it a gay destination resort. The whole river community started changing. It started to improve big investments, a gay destination. And then things started to change around 1983 uh, with the starting of AIDS. And so, so one of the things was that the Russian river community, even though when I came, it was challenging, 
But when the gay businessmen came and started investing, it started to change with the openness of, their, of the lifestyle. And it, not only did it start to change, uh, it, it, it really changed for all of us. So when I started going up, up river to Santa Rosa and starting to get involved, I was relatively surprised to hear the experiences of several of these Latino leaders. So a vision occurred about the creation of bringing Latinos in general together to be able to be a group, maybe group therapy, to be able to talk about racism, to be able to talk about overcoming racism and being able to talk about believing in ourselves and that yes, we can overcome those insecurity. We started with seven, today we're over 2,300. We're an inclusive organization and part of our vision, the strength of our vision is to be able to, to, to embrace our whole community with our culture, our tradition, and to also let them know we want the same as they do. We don't want to have to strategically continue to start thinking, how do we navigate that system? How do we navigate and, and not make anybody uh, uh, alienate, reject us because of certain and common things that we want and the things that we want to express? And so with that, with that organization, LOCIAN moving forward. This is what our drive is. This is what I lived, many of us lived. We don't want the next generation to have to live. The same steps that, that at times I continue to take, no matter how involved I am in the community. And so for me, my heart felt my passion in what this board, this commission for the first time that we have this opportunity to guide us. And not only that, to be able to implement the draft of the equity principles, taking an equity lens, something that I can tell you 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I wouldn't be saying this in an open public meeting because I feared it. So I, I just wanna say, based on everyone else that's delivered such impactful information and educational information and heart information that I believe the same. And all I am looking for is that we all, we all can be at the table and not on the menu. Thank you. Thank you, hermano. Um, thank you all, and and to the commissioners. Um, our our goal with this panel was to humanize this work in a way that that uh, we hope we've left you with tonight. Um, as we begin the study of maps, as we continue the study of maps, uh, I, this the process is going forward. The community engagement from diverse voices and communities is so so important, and uh, I hope these. Uh, the, the input we got tonight stays with you and helps you and guides you as we continue the map review. Um, but for now, um, I'm gonna turn it back to Ed. And I know there's, a, we've run a little over a little bit on time, but there is a, I think it's important to take some questions before we move on with the rest of the agenda, if you don't mind. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. I, I... I want to again thank our speakers for sharing their expertise and especially their emotional, their powerful, personal stories. I know it takes a lot to bring up the memories and it's unfortunate and heartbreaking that it often takes the discomfort and the trauma and the burden of people of color to recount histories that have been forgotten by most. Um, so thank you all for your narratives and your powerful stories. Um, and Magali, I, I may have cleaned up some of your tagging. Um, <laughs> graffiti abatement uh, for the city of Santa Rosa was one of my first engagements in our community. And that came about because when I moved here over 15 years ago, I was out running on the Santa Rosa Creek Trail. 
and I came across um, some swastikas tagged on the pathway and on the bridges and feeling a little bit connected to the community. I was here for graduate school. I ran up um, the street to the paint store and bought a couple of cans of black spray paint. And I ran back to cover up the taggings because it was a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning. And there were a lot of families and they were drawn to, to these swastikas. Um, and so I started covering them up and somebody called the police and there were families there that came to my defense and I was pointing out to the officers where I had covered it up. And they told me about the city of Santa Rosa's graffiti abatement program. <laughs> and they gave me a, a number to call and got me connected. And that's what I did. I spent the next couple of years getting calls in the early morning to go out and clean up taggings of various sorts. Um, but that's a little bit of my personal story. Um, so again, I want to, um, to thank you all for, for, um, for sharing these really important stories. I, I'm going to take, I want to be brief because again, this was intended to be more um, for listening. Um, some brief questions or comments from the commissioners. Uh, if you could raise your hand if you have questions or comments. Um, if you don't, just please take away um, these really powerful stories. It looks like Ana Lugo, you have your hand up, Ana. Yes, thank you, Chairman Sheffield. Um, thank you so much. I am so just in awe of each and every one of you and so grateful that you took the time to come talk to us. Um, this is the first commission that has been established to do redistricting uh, for the County of Sonoma. And also I do believe majority people of color. So um, I just think it's such a historical moment on so many levels to be able to hear your stories. Uh, Professor Flyswith Hutz, I was one of your students and I just love, love just the caliber of your profession and everything you do. So I'm deeply grateful um, for all of you and whomever wants to answer this question. I wonder, so when we talk about communities of interest, we're talking about communities that hold similar um, characteristics. Um, and so when we talk about BIPOC communities, Black Indigenous people of color um, communities, are there specific geographic um, locations that you want us to keep in mind? For example, if we went out into remote West County or other areas, East Sonoma County, or maybe Magali for you around young people, uh, specific geographic locations that you would want us to make sure we are paying attention to when we're uh, redistricting. I, I think Southwest Santa Rosa, you know, Roseland, Moreland, I think a lot of those communities um, sometimes are kind of lumped together, but I think they all have, they're all different, have special needs. And it seems like over the years, it tends to be forgotten or not, not really paid attention. That area and also the area over in Santa Rosa behind um, Target and Costco, you know, near South Park, like an extension of South Park, there's an area back there. And I feel like that area as well. If I could make a comment, uh, here in the Russian River area over the last 10 years, um, one of the things that, that I have noticed that is occurring, the Latino population is increasing, not in the thousands, but, in, but, but I can just tell you that we have had, uh, and, and, and those that I've been able to speak to, we have had um, in, uh, Salvadoreño families that are moving to Guerneville, and there are others that are following coming from other areas. And part of that reason is because of the affordable housing that, that is being offered in converted garages that are in the flood zones. And we had 38 families get flooded in 2019. Um, we, we are also uh, able to have, uh, um, and again, it's been two years that we have just about a little over 100 
Latino participation at the Guerneville School where individuals in the communities noted there are no Latinos in this community. And so this area, again, because of the affordable housing availability, if that's what you want to call a converted garage, a trailer, that are moving into these areas as housing, and it's growing. And many commute to Santa Rosa to work. Thank you, Herman. Um, let's just take one more question. Karen, you have your hand up, Commissioner Weeks. Uh, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to echo the thanks, to, my personal thanks to the panel for all your comments. And I also wanna follow up on Anna's question. Um, Sylvia, you talked about neighborhoods in Santa Rosa um, and Herman just mentioned Guerneville. What about other areas in the county? There are other areas. And I think that if you look at the data that's already been prepared by some groups like um, Portrait of Sonoma, that would really highlight standard of living, you know, um, education, health, um, um, a, a lot of different factors that will really point you to areas in Cloverdale, in Boys Hot Spring area, in um, Santa Rosa. There's a lot of areas that already have been identified that really need the support. Thank you. Thank you all again, once again. Um, I, you know, I, I, I know we're, we're pressed for time, but I do want to circle back. We haven't heard from, from members of the public that might be listening. I do want to take a moment and see if we have um, members of the public who are participating that would like to briefly comment on what was presented. Um, if we could do that. Do we have members of the, of the, of the public? And this might be a question for you, Yvonne, or county staff. I don't see any hands raised. Great. OK. Um, we're going to move on very quickly, not very quickly, but with, <laughs> with mindfulness um, to agenda item number three. These are the recommendations. And let's have a discussion of equity principles. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Equity and Ad Hoc Committee has created a document for us with equity principles that can help um, guide the work of the commission. I'm wondering if we can put those recommendations up on the screen for all of us to see. Great. And we're going to actually have um, Commissioner Shields uh, from the Ad Hoc start us off in a discussion. I'm going to turn it over to you, Commissioner Shields. Thank you, Chair Sheffield, and thank you again to all the speakers tonight. It really was a, an honor to bear witness to the stories told today and have that really ground our conversations and our work. Um, the, just for process, the Equity um, Ad Hoc Committee came together and was tasked with creating some uh, concepts to help us. And I want to thank all my fellow equity ad hoc members for their uh, leadership and contributions to this. This does represent kind of multiple sources of input. But we wanted to put down on in writing um, some basic principles to guide us, some values that would be our North Stars, norms in terms of how we operate in our own meetings, and a visual of what equity across all parts of this process and of course our final product would look like. This is a draft and it is still kind of being addressed and we appreciate having uh, more eyes on this and input on this, but it does reflect from multiple sources uh, th some of the considerations that are uh, cross um, equity work in, in government and in education and so with that, I leave it to any of the other equity ad hoc members to comment on process and certainly uh, address anything that might be missing or that could be made stronger in this draft um, of the document. So we were given uh, this document in advance um, um, to give us some time to think about it. 
And so I'm wondering if there are other commissioners who want to talk a little bit about the process and, and the importance and the value of these principles. And I can't see hands here. <laughs> um, Actually, Ed, uh, Chair, if you, if just a couple of comments. Um, I participated in the conversation uh, on the ad hoc uh, on the equity, and, and I am uh, completely uh, in support uh, of this. I, I, I find this interesting uh, on, on two different levels. Uh, the first is just the process and the conversation. Um, and I think it's important um, to have these. And I, and I think the second point is, this becomes um, principles, norms, and values uh, that are going to go beyond the redistricting process. And I think that that's actually results in the challenge that we have in moving this forward. And I too want to commend uh, all of the panelists today for sharing you know, their stories with us. Uh, the challenge we have with the county is by law, um, we are to have five supervisors and the task, uh, the challenge to, to make sure that people feel that their voice uh, <clears throat> be listened to and counted uh, is, is an imperative uh, to make democracy work. Um, and it, we're gonna struggle with that as we try to put maps together under the guidelines of redistricting uh, that have been shared with us. Um, and keeping this, these, uh, this equity lens in mind, uh, I, I think is, is gonna be helpful, but I think it's also gonna make our jobs even harder uh, to do it and, and to be able to have people feel at the end of the process that they were heard, uh, they were included and there is a path forward uh, for them. I think the, the challenge is, has just gotten uh, steeper for us. Yeah. But thank you to the uh, other members of the ad hoc uh, on the equity lens, um, I think, uh, and I completely support uh, these values. Thank you, Commissioner Martini. Thank you, Commissioner Shields. Are there members of the commission um, who would like to speak at this time? Further discussion on, um, on these principles, these recommendations. Ed, this is Cynthia Murray, if I may. Yes, please. So um, I wasn't on the ad hoc committee and I, earlier I said my name thinking we were doing roll call. So I apologize for that. I didn't mean to add to the confusion, um, but this has been a very powerful afternoon listening to people share their, their lived experience and, and how they feel as members of a community and what needs to be done to build and strengthen the community so that everyone feels that they can participate and that they are valued and heard. And I really appreciate the principles and the norms that have been developed. I, I agree with Mike Martini, these should be taken and used broadly and not just for this process, but um, applied to uh, all other things that we're trying to do to bring equity um, into what we do in Sonoma County. And it, it's heartbreaking to think that um, it's taken so long for us to even develop them and, and acknowledge how important this is. Um, for us to, to be able to move forward at a time when there is so much division and an and, and, and extraordinary need for that division to be healed and for us to find unified solutions to move forward. Um, we have just have amazing amount of challenges right now and it's very clear we can't do it alone. We need each other and the more we can work together uh, to better our community and to help the people who live, work and, and uh, play here, the better. So uh, I'm very proud to be part of this commission and to see these uh, norms and uh, principles adopted. And I don't know if you need a motion to do that. Yeah, uh, yes. we'll get to that. Absolutely. Okay. Commissioner Murray, I, I do have an intention of us taking some formal steps. Um, thank you so much. I see um, Commissioner Bohr, Chris, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I, I want to commend the ad hoc uh, committee. They, you, you obviously have given this a significant amount of thought, and the fruits of your labor are, are really very strong and um, are really terrific. Uh, at the risk of diving into a little bit of wordsmithing, I, I did want to call out a couple areas I think may be an opportunity here. 
And the first is around values. I, I agree with all of the values listed here, but feel that we're missing the value of inclusivity. And I think that th that's one thing that is, I think, core to all of our, our focus and our, and our work, you know, that we've done and, and we're looking to, to also accomplish. So I would recommend we add inclusivity as an additional value here. And then under principles, um, if we look at the third principle, uh, identify and strive to align equity-based communities of interest so that they have the greatest opportunity for representation. I, I would recommend we move equity-based from being the adjective to communities and place it just before representation so that we identify and strive to align communities of interest so that they have the greatest opportunity for equity-based representation. I, I, I don't think that's really materially different than what the committee was trying to get to, but I think it really strengthens what the end goal here is that we're trying to, to achieve. Um, and then, and, and this, and I'm being totally transparent, this may be simply an unconscious bias I have, and I'm doing the work, I'm trying to get better. Um, I'm a little bit sensitive in the fifth uh, principle that we're talking about historical context and, and um, accommodating you know, differences and shortcomings we as a community have had for other parts of our community. But I don't think that only refers to the BIPOC community. I, I, I think there's a significant amount of um, injustice that you know, our LBGTQ community has also experienced. I recognize though that it may be tough as we're thinking about redistricting to figure out where to draw lines to help enhance the LBGTQ community, but I, I feel we would be uh, missing the boat if we didn't, didn't at least recognize that community as well as BIPOC communities. Um, and that's really, that's really the, the gist of my thoughts here. I think it's an excellent document. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, let's see, we have uh, Commissioner Lugo with her hand raised. Anna? Thank you, Chair Sheffield. Um, so to begin, I wanna give the context that this is a complete draft. This is not a final document. So uh, we should not be approving it this evening, but we should be giving a lot of feedback so that a final document can come forward. Um, the equity ad hoc will be meeting again in a week or so to finalize and also look at a lot of the rich information that was given today and look at maps around age and other factors. So um, this is not the final, this is only the beginning. Um, the values are missing actual definitions to, to uh, create accountability as to what we mean for, uh, for each word. Um, and then to Chris, uh, to Commissioner Bohr's point, uh, the naming of BIPOC communities really arises out of the Voting Rights Act and its intention around redistricting. We also know that um, race is the single, uh, single biggest predictor for how people will uh, live out their lives in the United States. Race, racism was uh, the key foundation to systems in the United States, hence why all of our systems across the board have incredible systemic racism and why we are hearing the stories that we are hearing today. So while there are many other communities that have been deeply affected and intersectionalities definitely play a role, uh, there, it's also really important to recognize why the Voting Rights Act happened, why the Civil Rights Act happened, and why race needs to be um, uplifted so that we can truly understand that um, it is the single biggest predictor. And we know that. We know how people will live their lives based on their race uh, due to systemic racism. So uh, there's no such thing as passive participation. Everybody becomes an active participant, whether we give feedback or not. Um, so it is important that we get a lot of feedback tonight so that we can come back with a fully finalized document. Thank you. Thank sure, you. Sheffield, if, I, if I may just make a, a, a very quick statement. Thank you, Anna. That's very, very helpful. 
in, in I totally respect the importance of race in historically, but also within the work we're doing. And I, I, I'm very happy to see that, you know, principle number four, I think really goes to the heart of, 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 of many of the points you were just making. And I think that is a perfectly worded, um, you know, statement on its own. I was just offering some thoughts about the next following statement, uh, number five. Thank you. Thank you both commissioners. Um, uh, Commissioner Shields has her hand raised. Uh, just a matter of process. I wanted to make sure someone's taking all these notes. I mean, is that me? Is that someone else? Is that Steph? I don't know. I just want to make sure someone's capturing it. That was one. And then um, second, I make a friendly um, recommendation that instead of inclusivity for under the values, we include belonging. Inclusivity still kind of um, suggests, and this is nuanced, but again, defining our own vocabulary and making specific choices to reflect our values. Inclusivity still reflects like somebody is saying yes or no, where a sense of belonging is we are all, we all have rights to this space and this time and this effort. And so for me, again, we all have our own lenses and we come with our own like, um, little trigger points or, or things that catch our eye or are important to us. So I would ask that people consider instead of inclusivity, use belonging, which goes to the same, I think, core value, but the way in which we use the language really is uh, ceding power to all versus having a gate and saying, we'll choose to let people in or not. Again, very nuanced, but I, I offer that to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shills. And, and yes, um, we have Yvonne and Christelle who are keeping notes and comments. I'm trying to jot down notes as well. A little bit difficult. That's a good thing we are recording this meeting. Um, Commissioner, um, well, it, Ray, you have your hand raised. Um, yeah, to um, Commissioner Boer's point, I, I guess, in, 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 and thank you, Anna, for clarifying this uh, uh, regarding the, the, the the uh, the legal status of this, but I think that if, as far as inclusivity goes, I mean, it's race, it's gender ID, it's ability. Uh, don't forget handicap people. Uh, th these are these are typically also, um, you know, portions of our population that have been you know segregated or um, uh, misrepresented. I feel. Um, so if we can, I think just a broader, I think it's important to be specific and I think it's also important to be broad. Thank you so much, Ray. Okay, I do not see other hands from commissioners and I'm wanting to move this meeting along. Um, so I would like to maybe have an informal nod uh, to adopt these principles um, to support us as we work with the community um, and the board of supervisors in drafting more equitable maps. We have a draft right now. So for folks who are already out there engaging um, folks in the community or hearing from folks in the community, we can use that as a template. Um, but with edits, um, it, it, my understanding, um, it's the wish of the ad hoc that we'll bring it back to uh, the commissioners and for the supervisors as a um, set of criteria presented without expressed priorities or um, as a recommendation to follow when practicable. Um, I see additional hands raised. Oh, yes. Um, Ms. Fly, Dr. Flies with Hawks, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson Sheffield. I, I know I'm not a commissioner, uh, but I, I just wanted to comment, if I may, and I appreciate uh, Commissioner uh, Badella given voice to this acronym BIPOC, and I'm going to encourage you to do your own further thought around that. What I want to say is that BIPOC is not, that acronym is not um, accepted uh, by all folks in uh, across uh, uh, people of color communities. Um, it's, it was brought in to put in the forefront part of it is to really, um, especially since the murder of George Floyd, uh, to really recognize and put forward, you know, the needs of the black community and the wrongs that have been done there. And also then indigenous people that uh, we continue to be invisible. 
Uh, and then again, there's the person of color, uh, that POC. But what happens is when we use an acronym like that, we are, whoever's using it is, is not intentionally, but it does happen. There is an erasure of the individual groups. So I, I ask you, would you please think about just writing out, it takes a little bit more space in whatever document you're using, but instead of saying BIPOC, you know, that you say black, you say indigenous, you say, uh, you know, a Asian Pacific Islander, uh, and that uh, you, you, you say our ethnic groups so that none of us, it's real clear who you're talking about and there's no potential for erasure in anyone. So um, that's what I'd like to share with you about that. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Fleischer Docs. Um, other questions, do I see other hands? Oh, I see Lin Linda. Yes, Chair Sheffield, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to listen and learn from you all. And I just wanted to make sure before there's an informal vote on this agenda item that we listen to the public as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, do we have other commissioners? All right, let's take it to the public. Thank you for the reminder, Linda. Thank you so much. Are there members of the public who would like to speak? Okay, not getting um, response that there are hands raised. Um, again, I'm not. I'm. I'm really looking for an informal nod. So, um, oh, Dr. Flies with Hawks, yes. My apologies again. No. Um, uh, could you, uh, I want to know, understand the process because you're now going to a vote and then no, I, we're, we're, we're oh. I just want to, I want to get a sense that we're headed in the right direction. Oh, thank you. Okay, we're, thank we're, you. we're getting some good recommendations from the ad hoc to put forward that they want to maybe wordsmith this a little bit. Um, I just want to get a sense from all of us that we're moving in the right direction. Beautiful. Thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. All right, I'm seeing I'm seeing some, some some thumbs up. Okay, good. We're headed in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, so I am, unless there are any additional questions, I, I'm going to move on to agenda item number four: um, commissioners' input on communities of interest. Um, agenda item number four allows commissioners to provide input on communities of interest over the weeks ahead, individuals and organizations um, are able to provide input and to propose their own redistricting maps um, that prioritize communities of interest. Uh, so at this time, we're going to have a review of some maps that reveal locations and distributions of various key groups in the county. Um, you know, we, we've heard some um, identified, uh, um, Sylvia Lemus had, had, had brought up Roseland and, and Moreland and South Park and, and neighborhoods that, that she grew up in and very familiar with and, and even um, Cloverdale. Um, it was also mentioned off of Petaluma Hill Road right behind Target. Um, uh, you know, we are familiar with some of these neighborhoods. Um, but we really, you know, also I think it was suggested to look at data from the portrait of Sonoma County. That's a great, great suggestion. Um, but at this time, I'm gonna turn it over um, back again to Dr. Perez to guide us through a discussion of identified communities of interest as we look at these maps. Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to warn you all that this could be a little frustrating because we're not able to in this meeting overlay the maps. So there, this is just actually in, in part to stimulate people to please look at the maps, especially the interactive maps, because it gives you an opportunity to, to really do the kind of analysis that needs to be done. <clears throat> There's been very little uh, feedback, quite frankly, so far. And uh, uh, Chairperson Sheffield, you're one of the few people that submitted a form on the communities of interest. And, and I know it's complicated, but we do, I think everyone's encouraged to, to please participate. So anyway, we want to we want to show some maps and uh, see where people are located. Uh, let's start by looking at the current district map. Could we put that up, please? 
And uh, Yvonne, are we able to make that any larger? Is that it? Um, which section? <laughs> any of it. <laughs> kind of in the center. Okay, let me see. We're talking about Rosalind a lot, I'm curious to see how we, where we see it. Is it completely located in five? Is yeah. that better? Yes. Okay. Okay. Just a, anyway, this is the current, this is the current map that we are assessing and we'll be making comments on. Uh, we heard a little bit earlier about uh, Connecticut and Mississippi. Can we kind of see where people are living that make an income of over 75,000? I think that's the next map we have, income map. As this fills out. And so you can see that, yeah, 75 to 100% is pink, income over 75,000. And you can see where the where those that do not make that, much, that, much, that kind of money live. It's, I think there's no surprise here as we look at the distribution. Dr. Um, Press, may I ask you a question? Certainly. Um, I just want to clarify or understand the, the legend here indicates what percentage of the population within a district or census unit is at or above 75,000 for income. Is that That's the way correct. to interpret this? Okay, That's thank you. correct. And the, um, the colors tell you the percentage, of course, but you could see that by district and how it's divided. Uh, let's look now at another group, and I'm just I'm just saying, okay, this just this is just a hmm. Uh, take a look and see what it, it. You may want to jot down some questions. This is what I would recommend: is jot down some questions that come up for you or comments as you're looking at these maps right now for discussion later. Where are the renters? Can we see where the renters are? And one thing I would just add is, you know, we have a map that we're probably not going to share tonight, but it's included in that packet, is the density of the population of area. So when you're looking at the percentage, understanding what that total population looks like, um, we'll let, give you more insight into the number of people that actually right. affects. Yeah. And I think, we, I think we understand, for the most part, I think the denser populations lie along 101 um, in the city of Santa Rosa and parts of Petaluma up through Cloverdale, uh, and we know that parts of the northern coast are very underpopulated. But anyway, this will give you a sense of, again, if you take a look at uh, an area like Pennant Valley, very smaller percentage of renters, zero to 25%. Yet you go to uh, some parts of uh, four and three, and you're going to see a much higher percentage of uh, 35 to 65% of uh, the renter groups and where they're located, and, and up in four as well. Um, so there is a marked difference between income and renting, and that also impacts representation. Now let's take a look at some of the ethnic groups. Um, with a large, start with the largest one, the Latinx population. Where is it located? And this is by citizen voting age population. Yvonne, would you explain what what population is it? Voting age does that include? undocumented residents, or is it only those who are eligible to vote? These are uh, citizens that's, um, who are over the age of 18 who can, who can vote. Okay. When they look at total population, that's everyone, uh, regardless of, of citizenship. But this, this data here is that what they call the CVAP, which is the citizen voting age. Okay. So when we get, we get an opportunity to look at the interactive map, we're gonna be able to see as well where let the Latinx population is that's not documented or is not a citizen group, correct? Because I think that's gonna be important to do. We've also asked for um, a map, which I'm, we're not able to show you uh, tonight, which shows by age, uh, ethnic groups by age, because as we heard earlier, I think it was from Dr. Malpica, uh, the Latinx population is quite young throughout the state of California and certainly in our county as well. And uh, so we want to see where those up and coming voters are re residing because that will impact voting um, in the near future. 
but uh, you can see that the populations, the strong, where are, oh, can we blow this up? Where are the stronger 50 to 75 percent population? Yeah, bits of the population. There we go. Green, yellow, and the pink. I don't think there are any surprises there. Any questions or comments about the locations? Looks like there are two questions. Okay. So. I can't see. Yeah, I see uh, Commissioner Weeks has her hand up first and then Commissioner Bohr. Commissioner Weeks. Thank you. Um, is, is it possible to get a map that shows renters with certain income or homeowners with certain income? Because I think um, just the way the housing stock is right now, um, there might be higher income renters does that make sense what I'm asking? <laughs> yeah, so if you know if you have a chance, I would recommend using the interactive review map and you can, you can zoom in on specific areas of renters to see and then you can click another characteristic in, such as income level and it'll narrow down that for you. Okay, I, I tried that, but I guess I need to try it again. Thank okay. you. <laughs> You know, I want to say back to the staff that I know a number of people are having trouble with the interactive map, and it's really an important tool. And so somehow, I, I, whether it's with individuals or with, with groups of people who want to study this more deeply, we've got to be able to do it because, as Commissioner Weeks said, you know, there are there are nuances: uh, higher income renters, lower income homeowners that maybe have been here for generations and have inherited their homes or properties. I mean, we don't. There, um, and of course, ethnicity is, can be all over the place, but we do want to understand this as, as the commission deals with looking at the fine elements of the maps and looking at potential redistribution. Um, but for now, this is all we have. We're not able to make these maps interactive tonight. Yeah. But there Dr. was a, was, there's oh. another question, correct? Yeah, Dr. Perez, Commissioner Bohr has his hand raised. Mm -hmm. Chris, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was I, I did look at this on in the interactive map, and I was kind of taken aback because there's some areas within District Three, and in particular Roner Park, where I live, as well as areas in the Springs that you know I'm familiar, uh, and I'm and I know how large Latino concentrations. This map isn't really reflecting what what I would expect. And it may be that we're just not able to zoom in and become granular enough, but I don't want to call into question our mapping tool because we're still looking forward to loading the data into it. But I don't know if you have any thoughts about some of the disconnect, at least I'm having it in reflecting the Latino voting age population in some traditional areas where we've seen higher concentrations than what I think the map is suggesting. Commissioner Boer, I think, um, again, we're talking about citizens. And when you think about that group alone, you're not going to get an adequate representation. I'm sure in your area, you have a lot of residents, you have a lot of non, uh, uh, you know, undocumented uh, residents as well. And of course, there is the young population that resides in, in Rona Park. Um, uh, without seeing all elements of the Latin, Latinx population, we're not gonna be able to really see its full impact throughout the county. Thank you. you, you clarified exactly my oversight that this is looking at citizens of voting age population of Latino descent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And this is a very, and I, and I think it's unfortunate that this is uh, the part of the map that is often looked at is just who can vote. But we're talking about in our county is really caring about the representation of all. <clears throat> so, um, so this is the citizen group of Latinos. Can we see the Spanish speaking population? And you're gonna see some differences here. Look at parts of area four that show 25 to 35% Spanish speaking in a very large area. Not well populated, but a significant, a significant percentage. Same with parts of one. And I found that really very, very interesting. Uh, 
uh, you know, the, the other areas that I think everyone would assume would be Spanish speaking are there, but um, uh, the extensiveness of that rural population is, is pretty deep. Um, and is different than if you were to, if you were able to lay side by side Latino population and Spanish speaking population, you're gonna see differences. Any comments or questions about that? Okay. I have um, a question. Yeah, go on. Um, is the area on in District Four on the eastern side where you have the darker pink and uh, darker blue and the lighter blue, is that where the glass fire happened? Mm. Good question. Because it says Dry Creek there, right? Isn't this around where like Corazon Hillsburg <laughs> is? Yes. Can anybody else clarify that? But I think the answer to that is yes. Glass fire was um, more Sonoma and, and like Sonoma Valley and North, like uh, East Santa Rosa. Kincaid. Yes, that's it. Kincaid. Thank you, Christelle. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there are, let's move on to uh, the map of Native American populations. And there are some visible pockets there. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Flies with Hawks had to leave us, but uh, you can see that there are actually a few pockets that indicate 75 to 100%. And I don't know if anyone has any, any information about those groups, those locations. The one on Stewart's point is the Kashaya Reservation. Ah. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the pink kind of in the middle above Forestville is the Lytton property outside of Windsor. It looks a little far, but that could also be Yakama. It's interesting. There was an, another point, and I don't know how we deal with it. If uh, is, is Segretta still with us? And, and, and well, she, I, I think she had to go to an NAACP meeting. Just as uh, for, for the group's knowledge, um, she had shared with me when we were talking in preparation for the panel that um, there were a lot of, Af because, Af because African-Americans were limited to where they could live in the county for so long, oftentimes it was with Native Americans. And she, so there's a lot of history there, joint history. And she's shared with me stories of, that go on till today, of native individuals or families that are still trying to hang on to what they have, what has been identified as sovereign property for them. And, you know, I, I don't know how, or if we can identify those, I just want to be sure because she says people have had to spend a lot of their money maintaining uh, the sovereignty of the, of the land that they've inherited. And it's very individual and very, but very important. And I think it's something that we would want to, to certainly preserve. Um, uh, uh, many of them are around the Roseland area in Sebastopol, of course. Does anyone have any knowledge about that? Okay. I do see uh, Commissioner Lugo's hand raised. Do you have a, no? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Perez, I'm sorry, continue. Oh no, that's fine. Um, and then let's look at, uh, there's some interesting pockets with the Asian American population. Um, notice the blue up in four. Christelle, was that the, okay, you were talking about Cloverdale as well, and I don't know if that shows up. There's apparently a segment of Cloverdale that has a large, It's very hard to see, but like right up here, there's a tiny speck of blue. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> here, let me see. If... Right here. Yeah. So that's why it's it's hard to represent here, but you can zoom in on the on okay. some of those online tools. Yeah. And then we have that that uh, population just 
uh, west of Healdsburg and over by Timber Cove. That's rather interesting. Um, don't think we have anybody here that can talk to us about those populations. What I find always interesting about when you start to see small communities like that is you wonder their history, if they're newly there or if they've been there a while. Because um, in the history of uh, immigration in the United States, sometimes people start landing somewhere and their families come <laughs> and you can grow uh, communities quite largely in generations as um, families extend themselves to support each other. Okay. So, and then finally the uh, African-American population, which is small, but rather important to us. Just, just a few little pockets and dots and when Segreta was talking about kind of the Roseland area, we still see there's a little area there that remains with a significant population, but very small pockets. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what, I, what I hope is that we, we figure out how to address the participation of African-Americans in this county. We've got a large number of African-Americans leaving East Bay to get homes for their families going two or three hours south of Stockton and into uh, Merced counties. I mean, Sonoma County is much closer and uh, um, needs to, we need to work on the welcoming <clears throat> and kind of clearing out the history that's, that's been haunting us. Um, any comments about the African-American population? So I have a question. Yes, Anna. Is there a statistical threshold for at what point the, the um, is this counting every Black and African-American person in Sonoma County, or is this doing like uh, pockets over 100 people, pockets of over 50 people within the same general location, or do we know what the threshold is? I don't know. Yvonne, do you know? I'm sorry, you're saying with representation on the map itself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, my understanding, and I'm by no means an expert, is that it's based on census data, which is then right now what you see represented here is the data from the American Citizen Survey, but it will get repopulated with the actual data once we get it from the state uh, in a few weeks. So I think it's it's actually individuals. It's not, it's not a represent like one person equals 50. That is my understanding, but happy to get that clarified further. So, so in order to get people involved in this process, you know, this question of the engagement, we're going to have to create some tools for people to look at because this dialogue around communities of interest is just not, is not drawing people in. But I think maps that uh, before we can get to drawing some maps for the commission to study, we're going to have to put out some information for the community to look at. And so we can say, look at this, look at that. What do you think about this? And especially where in areas where there is some probably opportunity for some redesigning of the maps, yeah. realignment. And so I think what we need to, need to figure out is from you at this point is kind of what are the things that are important? What are the kinds of designs that we can have, because I think it's going to be some kind of playing with the tools that are going to, to draw people out. And, and so with that, I'm just, I'm wondering, and I know we've asked a lot of this ad hoc, but I'm wondering if, you know, we've, we've taken a look at these equity centric maps and I'm wondering if they, the ad hoc um, committee, can leave us with their key observations or strong recommendations for the commission um, on places that we should be focusing on. And maybe this is something that can be put out to the community as well, maybe as an addendum or an attachment to whether it's the, the, the paper maps or something that could be placed to, hey, you know, there are these pockets here, they look like this. You know, again, I don't want to be taxing taxing the the um, the ad hoc for too much, but um, you 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 all do seem to have a real sense of 
these um, these neighborhoods and these and these points of interest that we 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 could and should be focusing on, and maybe information that should get out to the public and to the supervisors as well. Um, we'll circle back to that, but I do see hands, Commissioner Manieri, Stephanie. You have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I had to turn my video off. I have unstable internet. Um, but I'm wondering. So I'm. What I noticed from the map um, is that we're clumping 0% to 25% together, and I'm a bit uncomfortable with that because I think that that's really misleading about the, the actual representation of folks in a given area. So I'm wondering if we can see at some time or if, the, if there's some sort of tool that allows us to manipulate that data so that we're not clumping 0 to 25 together and getting a better um, a more accurate representation of those populations. Like I'm uncomfortable that a lot of these maps say that we have like, it's in the purple at, for the, the African-American population or, or the Latinx voting population. And I think that we, we see those colors and then we think, okay, zero, like we think 0%, but that range is zero to 25. 25 is still significant. So um, I'm just, I noticed that and I'm wondering what we can do about that. So if I could, if you don't mind, um, Dr. Perez, I'll just interject just briefly. Um, so the request from the equity ad hoc was to have a set of static maps for everyone to look at just to kind of start this conversation. Um, acknowledging that the online tools that we have, you know, some of them require a little bit of time to actually get comfortable with. Um, but if you are, you know, have the time and are willing to kind of Laura, one of them, I would actually recommend the, um, the interactive review map. You can actually get more granular um, on specific neighborhoods. And this, these maps will just help you figure out which areas to look at, perhaps, as, as a starting point. But can we do zero to five, zero to 10? Is that possible? I cannot. I'm not. I don't know. I think you can, just based on getting closer in, although, again, I'm not an expert on those tools. Yeah, because I think the commissioner's point, especially in a county that is is really dominantly white at this point. I mean, I think it's really important to take a look at those smaller percentages. I don't know what the commissioners feel, but uh, I think it would be very helpful. Um, I do want to point out, um, Yvonne has also included the link to the interactive map in the chat. Um, it does, you know, I, I've been messing around with it quite a bit. Um, I know we couldn't do layering on the maps today, but you can really get a sense of um, real, real fine tune um, demographics using, um, using these mapping tools. It does take um, a little bit of practice um, and it might not be the easiest for um, everybody to use. So again, um, you know, my, my, my hope is that, um, we could have members of the ad hoc um, help us identify uh, these areas that we, we should be focusing on. Um, I do see um, Commissioner Shields and Commissioner Martini's hands up. Uh, Sokoro, do you want to go first? One, um, I th we should probably hear from the engagement subcommittee as well, the ad hoc, because I think they've done a lot of work, particularly at identifying areas and focus groups and places. And so I wanna make sure that they they probably should be the lead. I think all of us should be looking, but I think they should have the lead. My other comment, and only because I've had my own trouble with the maps and I feel like I'm generally um, technology sufficient, if not a little proficient, but, um, our, our districts generally run north to south. I wonder if it's possible, and I'd love to see something created by a demographer, and I don't even, uh, this might be too far, but whatever, uh, to go east to west. And I know that there has to be the balance between numbers and populations, but I'd like to see if it's feasible, something proposed by the demographer that goes more east-west than north than our north-south orientation. I'm curious about the. I have, con, I have concerns about Santa Rosa being, you know, chopped up into so many parts. It's kind of not recognizable, and maybe two instead of four. I, I because I know it has a population density, but I just think it it might be a way to incorporate to help 
support unincorporated areas. And I'd like a list by density and with demographic data of all the unincorporated areas. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think, I think Roseland used to be, but I think now probably the Valley is the highest density, highest uh, populations of color that is unincorporated. And I do think that means it needs special attention. And I think probably also out by the river is a high density, high vulnerability of being underrepresented. Like, I think we should be able to target those areas specifically unincorporated areas which don't have a municipality to support most of what they need. These are areas that, um, for lack of better terms, many times fend for themselves. I think we really need to be cognizant of the unincorporated areas and the demographics and density of the unincorporated areas, and I'm not sure I know them all. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost like them by name. Like I, I, I do appreciate the maps and I am a mapper, but I would almost yes. appreciate the names of kind of how we acknowledge them. Because I think, again, particularly for the engagement piece, they are um, areas that deserve their communities being heard and what they need from the county infrastructure in particular and the political way in which it is um, organized. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shields. Uh, Commissioner Martini. Um, one of the things that came up in the conversation that we had uh, about both engagement and the equity lens is you know, trying to you know, make sure that people have opportunity to participate. In my own efforts of growing out and uh, reaching out to various groups, I will uh, describe them all as being uh, interested. Uh, they understand the import of uh, the job that we are undertaking, but at the same time, um, they were not necessarily um, anxious to engage. They, they wanted to play around a little bit with maps and stuff, but one of the things that, that did come up in, in our conversation at the equity group <clears throat> was, you know, as of right now, people don't have something to respond to you know, we talk about what our ultimate goal is, but one of the things that I think we can do is actually put some maps up there and allow people to respond. I mean, we've got the beginning of equity lens. We've got the beginning of engagement. Um, if you have, uh, you know, one or two, three or four maps that somebody has put forward, people get the chance to respond to, and, and they will respond if they feel that they are getting uh, shortchanged. Um, and, and that one way to motivate them. In, in response to uh, Commissioner Shields, we do, one of, one of the ones I've been playing with is a, uh, a north, south, and then a central, um, just to, to take care of, of the population. And we can put together you know, those maps and put them up on a board, and then people can respond to them and say, wait a minute, you know, you, you've completely you know, blocked out these people, or you know, this doesn't make sense or this does, but it gives something for people uh, to respond to. And I've, I've done two, I haven't submitted them yet, um, but I think that's a, a step that could be taken where people get a chance to, to say what they think of it. You know, is this better for me or is this worse for me? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Martini. Um, Commissioner Acosta. Yeah, I was just gonna um, echo what he said about I would really encourage people to get into these tools. They do take time to get comfortable with. Um, I've gone in a couple of times and I'm trying, I've done this before and it's, but it's been a while. So, um, so I have gone in and started playing with some of the interactive tools. Once you get comfortable, it gets a little easier. Mm -hmm. um, just general comments about the kind of maps. I think um, I, it's my understanding that as people create these, you have the ability to share it. And I think they are gonna be posted. Yvonne might be able to clarify that or confirm that. But my understanding is if, if, if people are creating these, they can share those, they will be posted online. So that would be helpful if people, I think I, I agree, people need to see something. They need a starting point, it's just like we did with our equity principles. We need a starting point. It's hard to start from, from nothing and try to visualize this. Um, the other thing, just general comments around the kind of maps we'd like to see, um, I'm inclined to, uh, you know, we're going to have to propose, you know, three, four maps, several maps, whatever. We're going to have to have some target maps that the board will have to look at initially and then come up with some of those focus maps. 
I'm inclined to be very um, mindful of the kind of feedback we've gotten from community. Some of the comments we heard in the very first meeting about unincorporated, sharing unincorporated, sharing the coast, um, and then looking at all these other issues and coming up with, okay, we can go very conservative. You know, uh, the population hasn't changed dramatically in terms of just raw numbers. So you can do the bare minimum and say, let's just equalize population, make sure we're legal. And that's a very conservative approach. Or we can be very radical and give the board also this range of types of maps where we say, yeah, let's do horizontal you know, shape districts instead of vertical. Let's look at all those things. And of course, continue to be legal all the while we're doing it. Let's put, you know, Rohnert Park in one district as one, you know, com completely contained within one district. What mm -hmm. does that do to the map? It's going to have a dramatic effect. And I think what will happen is by being able to give the board very broad and very different from conservative to radical approaches to these maps, they're going to have to pick where they are, right? What is their preference? Where are they going to come down? And they're going to help guide us and give us direction about how radical do you want to get? Because they're going to have to be comfortable with those decisions and their constituents are going to have to support those decisions. That's who they're accountable to. And so I think if we can ensure that we have a very diverse set of looking maps, they don't look too much alike. We go very conservative, very radical and let the board chew on that for a meeting and come back to us and give us stretch. So then we know where to go from there to fine tune, to make sure that we're using those equity principles, using, um, using all the legal criteria. But I'd like to make sure that we have a very conservative map, very radical map, and one or two in between. Yeah. Thank you so much, Commissioner Acosta. And, and to your point, you know, when, when, when I did the districting process on San Rosa City Schools and we went through that whole step, it really was once we started seeing the maps come in that we were able to really hone in and target on specific areas. Um, it, 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 you know, and I've shared that with some of the commissioners and commissioners that, that might have some map ideas have been working with groups in the communities to, to, um, to, to, um, to draft these maps, you know, submit it, let us take a look at it. You know, we can build on and, you know, and, and maybe we'll, we'll um, through discussion and, and, and folks in the community, we'll get input and we can modify it here and include this neighborhood there. Um, it really did help us in the process. And I think it'll, it'll help here as well. Uh, Commissioner Weeks, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Chair Sheffield. So when I was playing around with the maps after the last meeting, I did a, I try, I tried to do a just run at park just Katati, because that was a comment that we had heard early on. And then I tried to do, uh, you know, the unincorporated area of Santa Rosa that's like divided up into three supervisorial districts. And it's very difficult, um, as I think those of you who've played around with it, um, and I'm not that tech savvy, but anyway, um, I was wondering if the consultants, the demographers are taking into account those public comments that we've received about what the public would like to see. And I think uh, the two that we've received so far has been have been around uh, Runner Park. And then we received an email from a woman who lived in the unincorporated part of Santa Rosa. So that was that's my question. Thank you, Commissioner Weeks. Um, Yvonne, hi. <laughs> There we go. All right. So yes, we, the demographer will take all the maps that are submitted through those tools and, and publish all of them with, with the accompanying um, data. What I would like to share um, is that, you know, we have the deadlines of October 8th and 15th um, for comments and or draft maps. And, you know, in a separate conversation, um, just clarifying the process um, with NDC, is that you know those kinds of comments, for example, from Commissioner Shields about well, how about a horizontal, you know, looking district approach? Feel free to submit that, right? Like submit it to redistricting 2021, and I will send it in. This is this is the kind of stuff that they need to hear um, as they wait, as we all wait for the California Census data to come in in a few weeks, whenever that is. Um, if they don't have any of that kind of input from you on what you kind of are thinking or what you're looking at, then all they have for the draft maps is that census data without any of that individual like local color. So, you know, even if I understand the map 
tools can be complicated and yes, yes, they are. But if you have comments that you would just like to share qualitatively over email, um, I would encourage you to send that in. Um, any, any concerns about specific neighborhoods or suggestions on how you might want, want to see things, this is exactly the kind of thing that they need to hear. Um, and so if you look at our schedule, you know, we have um, October 18th as the date where some draft maps will be presented to you based on probably that first round of feedback. And so I'm hopeful that it will be the census data plus the input we've received so far from the public, but also input from, from the commissioners. Thank you, Yvonne. Okay, I'm looking at the time. It looks like it's a quarter to seven. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to get a sense or maybe from the expertise of all the commissioners, maybe it's a better route to go um, before we, we leave today and looking at the maps the way that we did and hearing from um, the testimonials that we heard from our speakers on the panel. Um, that we we have identified some areas, you know, it was thrown out. We know the, you know, we know um, a lot of these, Roseland, the Springs area, Moreland, South Park, um, uh, Cloverdale, all of these areas. Are other commissioners, uh, you know, let's just throw it out there while we have a few minutes. If there, are, are there areas that we, we really know we should be focusing on? So when I'm speaking with folks in the community, I can say that. I can say, hey, you know, let's give some special consideration to where this neighborhood is located. And here's a little bit of historic context as to why that should be or shouldn't be um, drawn the way that it is. Commissioner, thoughts? All right, um, Commissioner uh, Willett. I, I know the Springs is a very important community, but we're we're located in the, in the smack middle of of District One. If we were to yeah. just re, redraw in any way, then then that's that's a to me a, a very critical area. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Commissioner Bohr, Thank you. And I echo that those comments. Um, the one thing I noticed when we were looking at the different maps, especially the Native American map. There seemed to be a little pocket, I think, in District 4 um, that represented a concentration of Native American uh, residents. I'm just wondering if that might be better aligned with the remaining balance of pockets of uh, like the, um, uh, you know, the various ran rancherias in District 5 to begin to consolidate Native American voice. So that would be a, a small little carve out from that little, little place where District 4 jogs west um, to move that community over to District 5, potentially. Very good. Very good point. Other commissioners? All right. <laughs> well, we, we know we have a lot to think about. Um, I am going to move on um, to agenda item number five, which is public comment. Uh, from uh, um, community folks that might be on on matters that are not on the agenda. Uh, any, any hands raised, any folks um, who want to give public comment on matters not on the agenda? All right. Um, unless I'm forgetting anything, leaving anything off, I'm looking at agenda item number six, um, upcoming meetings. Um, but before we, we, we get there, um, I just, you know, I want to conclude our discussions that we've had um, to again thank Dr. Rosa Perez. Thank you so much for your expertise and guiding us through this process. Um, I want to thank the Equity Ad Hoc Committee um, and staff for the, all the hard work that they do for DNC for putting together the, the maps uh, for us that we saw uh, tonight and we can use those tools. Um, and then just a special thanks to our guests. I know um, that, that a few of them had to drop off. Um, Dr. Brenda Flies with Hawks, Segreta Woodard, Herman J. Hernandez, Magali Larque, Sylvia Lemus, and uh, Dr. Daniel Malpica. Okay, upcoming meetings. Um, well, we do have a September 15th town hall. 
Um, um, so that's later this week, but we have our October 5th, as it was mentioned by Yvonne, our 8 a.m. Board of Supervisors hearing and October 18th advisory redistricting uh, meeting. Um, at this time, I just want to know, want to hear from commissioners, want to know if there are other pressing issues um, before we conclude the meeting. Your thoughts? Yes, Commissioner Acosta. I just wanted to clarify um, the October 5th meeting. I recall hearing that that was going to be a meeting where the board had wanted our presence at that uh, meeting. Is that going to be in the board chambers or is that going to be virtual? Do we have any sense of that yet or what the expectation is? It's it can be as of right now, it's both. Um, so okay. I, I don't know if these are gonna, these rules are going to change um, mm -hmm. in a little bit, but. Um, you have the option to zoom in. Got it. All right, Commissioner Weeks. Thanks. Um, will we be receiving a Zoom invite for the meeting on Wednesday? Or <laughs> is that on the uh, website? So I can clarify that the town hall, the town hall was kind of an extra uh, communication vehicle really for the public to learn about redistricting at the request of um, County staff, and so it's it's not an official commission meeting. Um, it's going to be run sort of a, akin to the other town halls that the county puts on related to fires or to, to COVID, and so it's going to be an hour long. Um, the link is actually on our website, but it is not. Um, it's going to be for English speakers, I believe. It is on Facebook, and for Spanish speakers, I believe it's on YouTube. I communications runs it runs the drill. They have the same vehicles that they use and it will be recorded is my understanding. Um, and we will have um, NDC on there for a short presentation and then we'll also have the chair and vice chair on there for, for Q&A, um, but it's gonna be an hour. It's, it's gonna be a really compact kind of event. And you know, tune in just to hear the, the um, if anything, to hear um, the community voices, hoping we can get good participation from the public on that one. Okay. Um, again, thank you all. Many, many, many thank yous to Dr. Prez for your expertise. Thank you so much, everyone. Look at this. It's, it's not even seven o'clock and we are concluding this meeting. Hope to see you all soon. You guys take care, stay healthy, stay safe.